we I hope you can hear me well. I think audio should be fine with the microphone. Uh, this one here. Uh, so we're super excited that so many of you decided to join this training. Uh, a big welcome from me uh, and Katya, my co-host. Please, Katya, say something. Hi, all together. Nice to meet you hey. here. Uh, Katya is in Sorrento, uh, sunny Sorrento. Uh, uh, hopefully, I guess you're holed up in your hotel room. Uh, well, I am in Munich, so uh, the marvels of modern technology uh, bringing us together here to, ge uh, to give that training together. I hope that will uh, work. Uh, Katya, I guess you can share your screen. You have the screen sharing feature as well because I'm yeah. making co excellent. Excuse so me. you can make yourself uh, heard and visible. If you have, uh, before we start, uh, some, I don't know, uh, general uh, uh, tips and tricks, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a couple of breaks. Um, I hope, so this is going to be four hours now uh, for our training. I we we will stop at seven p.m. Central European Summer Time, uh, so four hours from now. Um, if we're uh, finished earlier, that's also fine. If we if it takes five minutes longer, that's also fine. But if you, the point is, if you need to go away, if your family uh, pulls you away from the screen or stuff like that, that's not a problem. All of this training will be recorded and will be on YouTube after the conference at some point. Um, Paul will have to do uh, one of the uh, Plum, uh, Foundation uh, board members will have to will do that job and it'll probably take a couple of days to download everything from Zoom and upload everything onto YouTube. Uh, we can we will also add chapter markers to the video training and yeah so you can f if you miss something the point is don't worry it'll be on YouTube uh, so if you need to take a break uh, also if you have questions please use the slack uh, that will be the best uh, to, to, to use slack uh, you could also use the chat here in zoom um, but um, in case we miss a question, because there were too many discussions going on uh, on the side, please just ask them again or just unmute yourself and uh, say something loud. That's fine. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, because the, the whole Zoom meeting is, going, is being recorded, um, just dis keep your camera disabled. Um, that, that is fine as well. Um, before we start, Start uh, before I start sh sharing my screen. I would love to see all of you just for a second. I'm. Uh, I promise you. I will. This part will not be on YouTube. I will cut this part, so you're not going to be uh, on YouTube with this part. But if you uh, just enable your uh, camera for a second, so I can uh, wave at you and wave back. So many faces I know. Uh, I'm really uh, happy. Uh, that you decided to join our training. Um, I'm, you should give this training probably. A couple of you uh, have been around with Plone as long as I have, so you know more than me probably. Let's see, let's find out. Um, okay, excellent. Uh, I'll take a screenshot of that, maybe, yeah. Something like that, yeah. I'll not post that anyway, it's just a mem memorizer for me. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen, uh, so... Here goes screen sharing, excellent. Um, in case uh, screen sharing drops off or something, uh, just yell at us. Uh, we can uh, so we can uh, enable that again. You should see a browser saying "Mastering Plone Six Development." So uh, this is also the uh, the documentation we're following. Uh, it's on trainingplone.org and it's the mastering plone 6 development training that we're following it's been updated uh, yesterday and today and uh, many days uh, a lot of times but uh, i think the last commit was a couple of minutes ago i hope that went through um, so if you if you want to follow uh, the code examples use this to copy and paste, don't type, please don't type. This is only two times four, four hours training uh, and we don't have time for you to correct your typo mistakes. 
because I make them all the time. This is not a critique. It's just, it takes much, much longer to type it. But um, a word of adv advice, if you do the training at home, continue the training or redo the training at home, which I uh, strongly recommend that you do that. Um, don't copy and paste type instead if you have the time talk to your boss say hey i got this training for free from the conference and it's just it's it's maybe good but i'm not sure yet because it was only the two times four hour sneak preview uh, so i want to work through the whole thing uh type type the code because when you do your own projects you're gonna have to type it anyway a lot of a lot of your custom code and uh It'll it'll stick into your in your memory much better. So um, yeah, this if you want uh, you can switch off your video uh, if you want. Uh, it would probably be good for bandwidth issues. But if you want, you can also keep it uh, keep your video on, um, so you can wave at me if I say something stupid or at Katya if she says something stupid, which will certainly not happen. Um, so this training is uh, by default takes a week. Uh, so what are we going to do to make that happen in two times four hours? We're going to uh, start, skip a lot of chapters, and we're going to stop very early. So this training has, as you see here, uh, 40, uh, 54 chapters, and we will st stop, uh, I don't know, somewhere. Uh, much earlier here sponsor we're not going to get to sponsors uh 31 is uh the chapter we did last year at the at the end so and we're gonna jump uh ahead a lot uh, so if you think you missed something just read the online training or and that's also very important uh, we can be uh, hired, uh, Katya and me. We are certainly available to do in-house trainings for you or your company. Um, we did that a couple of times already, uh, various topics. Uh, so feel free to contact us, uh, either her or me, or even us as a, as a team. Um, she lives in Switzerland, don't you, Katya? Where do. exactly do you live? In Zurich. Beautiful. So... If you're in, uh, if your company is based in Switzerland, Italy, or I don't know, somewhere south of Munich, uh, you probably should call here. If you're in Norway, you should probably call me. No, uh, yeah. Uh, the point is, uh, we are for hire, guns for hire, and not only for trainings, but also for plan development. We, we live of this stuff, so um, consider uh, giving us a job. Um, we put, we're both pretty busy at the moment, so this is this is not a plea for uh, for jobs, um, but at some point we will looking for more. Um, so, okay, let's. Uh, this is about this. Is, this thing is uh, ten years old. The training now. Uh, this is the video. This is incredible. Uh, I would love to hear some of you, uh, something about you. But since it's an online training, I will not force you. We'll will not do this uh, introductory round. If you, uh, the point here is, um, I we would like to hear what's of interest to you mostly. Uh, to discuss and give depth, uh, more in depth. Um, 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 de deal with these issues more in depth during the training. Since it's only a abbreviated online training, we, we can't really do that. But at the end of today and at the end of the training tomorrow, uh, we'll have about an hour or 45 minutes um, open for discussion and feel free to, uh, to, to jot down any questions that you have. For example, uh, I have this uh, business requirement or my client asks me to do this and that, or can we do this and that with Plone? Uh, these are, is, that would be an excellent time to pick our brains uh, to get, uh, get, get these uh, uh, questions answered. So during this training, uh, we will create, um, guess what, a website. That's what Plon is good for. And uh, the website we're going to build is for a conference. And the conference is going to be a Plon conference. And it's the Plon conference in the year 2035. And it's going to be held on Mars uh, because Plon obviously rules the galaxy by then. 
and uh, we're going to try to fulfill a couple of requirements. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of them, but obviously, if you if you have a conference, um, people should uh, go to that website and uh, yeah, learn something uh, from. Uh, about the conference, when it happens, where it happens, if there is a talk registration open, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, you also want to find information about what kind of talks are there, if there are trainings, what are the keynotes and the keynote speakers. So this is basically stuff that you could do with uh, just normal documents. You just write that down. But you, we want to structure that some more. And to be able to structure that, um, a, we could do that without structured content, but we want our uh, speakers to be able to submit, submit their own talks and to have that in a uh, same way we create a content type for talks and so speakers can submit them. And then I want to want to be able to edit my talk before I submit that. And, and I want to be, uh, as an organizer, I want to see a list of all submitted talks and so on and so forth. Um, yeah couple of requirements and the, the most important point about that is not like there are complex requirements these are like everyday things uh, the requirements change because uh, your I don't know your boss forgets something or just a, a new requirement comes in and all of these uh, things happen during the lifespan of a project because uh, let's be frank you never got a, a project definition before you started that that was 100% set in stone and never changed during the uh, during the course of the project when you did the project. So for example, uh, at some point we decide uh, we're not going to only have talks, but actually these talks are going to uh, happen at a certain time in uh, in, 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 in the year. Uh, so we need to add a time and dates. And also these talks are going to happen at a, in a certain room. Hopefully next year we're going to be in a physical room and not in a virtual room. Uh, so these are things that uh, in this use case uh, you forget. Uh, you forgot when you started making you creating your website. And at some point, uh, yeah, this we, we will need to do that. And there is a, a lot of talks, uh, tasks that we uh, that we need to uh, solve uh, for this. Uh, it will be interesting to for you to read through that. I'm not going to go through that. You'll realize what's going to happen. And also we'll not, uh, it's most important what we not do actually. We're not discussing professional theming. There's a uh, there's a, actually two trainings about that. Um, one for the classic front end uh, in Plone Six uh, that is today, and one for uh, theming Volto uh, that happens tomorrow. Um, a, a training about that. Uh, we're also not going to discuss uh, professional deployments. So if you really put that on the web uh, and hosting websites, this is not covered in this training as well. Uh, these are the most two most important things that we're not discussing. There's a lot of technical stuff that we're not going to do. I'm not going to tell you what Plone is because you're going to learn about that, but I'm going to uh, point out a couple of core concepts that if you are new to Plone, and uh, I guess a couple of you are, um, maybe unfamiliar to you. And one is uh, traversal. Um, so that is uh, that traversal is uh, stems from the fact that a uh, that Plone as a content management system stores content in a tree structure. So there is a, a tree uh, where the content lives. So if in this example here you have the site root and the, this tree has many branches and leaves and each uh, the whole tree acts like a nested dictionary. Uh, so each dictionary, uh, each uh, each branch is has again a dictionary as uh, yeah within it, and traversal is uh, walking through uh, from from starting from the root and walking down that that path towards an object. It's like it's like a folder structure in Windows or Mac OS or Linux. Uh, so it's very uh, very. Um, uh, familiar to you, how the content is structured. 
Um, and to access this, uh, a, a certain pint, kind of uh, content, you, you, for example, from the site, you have a folder and in that folder, there is a page. You can do exactly that. Uh, you traverse to that page going from the site to the folder to the page, walking down uh, that path. And uh, this is also the way that URLs are built. So you have a URL. If you go to demoplone.org, there is a demo site that you can use. And you have uh, this structure here, a demo, a folder, a page inside a folder. So there is no routing like you would do in, uh, say, Flask uh, to, to uh, expose a page inside a folder under this URL, but this is actually the structure of objects in that object tree uh, that's exposed like this. Okay, uh, that's number one. Number two is also super important. Uh, that Plone is built around the concept of object publishing. So if you have an object in your uh, site, in your database, um, you can call that object and this object will publish itself. So when you go to this URL, for example, or let's make it a bit simpler, DE demo a page, um, this object is found via traversal, traversing down that path, that tree, um, and this object is found and then this is called. So in Python, if you call something, you just do, uh, how did I go there? Uh, you actually call that by with this. So you open uh, your your brackets and close them. Uh, so here's your object, and then you call them. And once you call them, a lot of magic happens. There's actually a dunder call method uh, in 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 a base class in there, and that at some point makes sure that a template or whatever happens in there is rendered and it returns HTML to you. And this is actually what you see in the browser. So um, in a nutshell, this is exactly what happens when you open this URL. This object is called and this HTML is returned and your browser is smart enough to render that HTML in a nice way. Uh, that is the second uh, basic concept of Plone. A uh, third one is schema-driven content. So the, the content, uh, Plone is built uh, with content types, uh, for example, a folder or a document or a news item. And um, these are, all of these have a different schema. And the schema defines in other uh, um, frameworks, it's called a model, um, which kinds of fields basically are available to edit. So if I uh, use this demo page again, and I log in as an admin here, and I go to this edit that, I have a couple of fields here. So this is classic Plone. We're going to move to Volto uh, then in Plone 6 in a second. Um, these are the fields that are available. And these fields, all of these, there's a couple of fields actually, uh, they are defined in a schema. And you can, uh, these schema fields are then accessible as attributes on your object. So you not, can't, not only can call your object, but you can have these objects have attributes and the attributes store the value that you enter in a field, that field is defined in a schema. Uh, there's not only string uh, like text, like here's some description, but also more complex uh, attributes, obviously like an image that is its own object uh, named blob image in this case, and it stores the data as the attribute data. And here you have the binary data from that image, for example. And objects can have multiple schema, and they are combined to give you functionality that you can reuse. Um, enough of that. I'm not going to go into the component architecture, but it's just uh, it's a thing to prove that we're super smart and uh, you should be in awe of everyone who actually worked on that. And starting with Plone 6, um, Plone comes with two front ends. So there is the classic front end that you're seeing here on the demo Plone org page because Plone 6 is only in alpha stage uh, now. But there is also a six, uh, a demo of Plone 6. And these look a little, let me, um, hang on, classic. Let's open these side by side. So this is uh, Plone 6 classic, and this is Plone 6. 
This is the official uh, naming. Clone 6 has a brand new front end written in React, a JavaScript framework that you probably familiar with. It is uh, client side rendered. So the magic happens on your laptop or your in your browser, basically, where the templates are rendered. This whatever you see here is rendered in your browser. And here, this is in Plone Classic, Plone 6 Classic. This is server side rendered templates. So the HTML is returned uh, the ob uh, in, uh, via the concept of object publishing here. Actually, that's, um, that's interesting. I should probably update that. Uh, where's the object publishing part this year? Uh, because uh, Plon 6, uh, modern Plon 6 actually doesn't call the object. It uses the Plon REST API to, uh, to get a representation of that object as JSON and, um, and React or Volto, the front end has its own name, actually has its own logo uh, that we're not using here. Um, that makes sure that it's rendered. So object publishing actually is only true for, um, for Plone 6 Classic because uh, that's where the objects are directly called. And it's your job to decide uh, for whichever project you want to do, uh, which front end you want to use. Uh, there is still a ton of classic front end uh, projects around, and there, it's been very modernized. It uses Bootstrap 5 and Webpack, and it's super modern and it's super cool, but it's, yeah, it's not JavaScript, it's not React. So uh, in uh, Katya does a lot of Volto projects. Uh, so um, yeah. Depends on what you're doing. If you're a university and you have a site uh, with a uh, plon site with 200,000 objects in it and you're migrating to plon six, going uh, all in to Volto is probably uh, would be a hard task because you'd have to rewrite a lot of your own code. Uh, so they will probably use the classic front end. Uh, but if you're starting a completely fresh, a new project, uh, Volto is uh, definitely a smart uh, default choice. Okay, um, installation and setup, I'm not gonna go into that because you already hopefully installed Plone for the training. And if not, if you had any issues installing Plone for the training, uh, please, uh, write something in the uh, in the slack channel so we can uh, try to help you katya is available while i'm talking to help you assist you or if there's something fundamentally broken uh, we can discuss that together um, but uh, you should all fo have followed this uh, this installation um, what this is yeah uh, this is the technical setup as a training here, installing Plone without Vagrant. We're not, hopefully hopefully nobody tried to use Vagrant because they, uh, you will have, this will probably not work on a Windows laptop at the moment because our, our setup uh, doesn't, uh, is, is not updated for that. And Volto would not run, but you could probably run the back end in Vagrant. So yeah, you use it uh, directly in your, uh, in, in, on your laptop um, like this. Um, if you had pro problems, um, yeah, just tell us. Um, after we did this, you followed these whole instructions here and you got your clone running, you should have a setup that looks like this. Um, three minus L two, well, let's say one first. So you have a folder uh, that is basically empty in, uh, except that it also has two folders, one for the backend and one for the front end. The back end is in Python and the front end is in uh, React, in Volto. So uh, if I expand that to two, make that big bit bigger, you see that inside the folder backend, there is a source folder that contain, will contain the code that we write during this training for the back end and a couple of other folders that I'm not going to go into now, and a front-end uh, folder that also has a SRC folder, 
which will hold the code that you write for the front end during this training. So um, I uh, just uh, decided that I, I last year I used uh, Sublime for the back end and VS Code for the front end. This year I will use VS Code for both. Um, but I will, uh, me and Katya will both, uh, when we switch from back end to front end and vice versa, we will always try to take you with us and tell you where we actually are because we'll have to do uh, a lot of tasks uh, on both, not the same task, but to fulfill a requirement, you need to make changes to the back end and then you make changes to the front end. And only some tasks uh, require changes in one of these places. Actually, some, a lot of them uh, require changes in only one of these. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's a complex system and it's not getting easier by having a, a front end that is decoupled from the back end. Good. Um, with since no one wrote any uh, help, nothing is working in the Slack. I'll just um, keep on going, and we'll we'll uh, continue with chapter eight, starting and stopping clone, because that's what I'm going to do now. It's, it needs to go away here. Uh, so when I'm in this uh, folder, um, I first I'll stop everything. Uh, first, no, actually, I already started my front end because that takes a while, but I'll do that again for you. So I have two terminals and you should do the same when you're doing clone development on your local machine. If you're a front end developer, that, that's a different story. You probably, uh, some back end developer got you a Docker uh, container and that's running and you only care about React. Uh, if you're a back end developer and you only do back end, you have clone running locally and you're doing your stuff there and you don't care about any of the JavaScript nonsense that your colleagues two rooms over are doing. So, but in this training, you're doing both because you're gonna be a full stack developer. I hate this word, but still, uh, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna uh, do, you're gonna learn um, how to work with Python and with JavaScript, but not only Python and JavaScript, but actually, Clone, which is a huge stack on top of Python, and React, which is a huge stack on top of JavaScript. Uh, did I? Yeah, well, didn't say anything stupid here. So I'll go into the back end after I ran build out, um, which I already did, and I'll start my, uh, my back end with bin instance FG. FG stands for front foreground, not front end, foreground. So this is the debug mode. So I'm going to see a output. Um, everything that's happening in my clone side is visible to me here. Um, and here I start my front end with yarn start after I installed that. Um, so you should have uh, approximately the same setup right now. And if you go to, um, if you go to a, Hang on, let me close these demo sites. If you go to, uh, once it started, you can go to localhost uh, 8080 because uh, the back end is by default running on 8080. The front end is by default running once it's finished. It'll it takes some time, especially when screen sharing, which also takes a toll on my laptop. Uh, it's a bit slower than, it runs on port 3000. So I'm gonna, uh, start my browser here and go to localhost 8080 and it's already telling me plone is running uh, and your plone site has not been added yet. Uh, we're gonna solve this riddle in a second. Uh, okay, Volto, here you see in the front end also it has finished and I can start that and I can go to the front end and it will say me tell me this page doesn't seem to exist because I didn't add plone yet. So uh, to create a plone site, I need to go to the back end. always. You can't create a plone instance in the front end. So when I say instance, um, see, we're talking about, about Python here. So a, a instance is 
so there is a class defined, there a class clone site actually. That I think that's what it's called. And when you create an instance of that, someone's instantiating that uh, clone site, calling clone class yeah. site equals clone clone site uh, brackets. And that's uh, in in a nutshell. That's what happening. Uh, what's happening when I click uh, this uh, the button here? Uh, you should use the advanced button. Going to switch to German uh, to English here, obviously, because that's the training language. Uh, keep your time zone. Uh, leave the name of your plone site as plone and pick the ploneconf site add-on. Uh, you, you need to pick that in, uh, because otherwise the front end will not work properly. This is auto created and automatically checked out uh, by your by build out when running build out. I'll click this button now and plone switches to English. And when I go to the back end, I see uh, when I scroll up, I saw ready to handle requests. And then I clicked after here serving on. And then a lot of stuff happened. And Plon told me about everything that it did, uh, including um, here, finished bundle compilation. That's the last uh, statement I see. And then I see a Plon site, actually. Plon conference 2035 is what it says. And starting now, I can actually see this is the back end user interface. And now I go to the front end user interface and I reload that same. Yeah, I should probably log out and log in again as admin. Yeah. So um, when I say this is the back end user interface and the front end user interface, this is actually Plone Classic. So there is no. Well, actually, there is, but we're getting to that later. Uh, but this is the 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 back end is the same as Plone Classic. So when I when we when we're developing Plone Six uh, using React, and we say uh, we need to do something in the back end, that either means we need to write some code in our editor, or we can go to the classic user interface and do some manual changes there. And you see, the content is the same. So if I modify, if I create a, a site here, for example, um, I'll create a site and I say test and page. And here's my, uh, here's test. It just says test. Why does it say welcome as well? It's kind of weird. Uh, something's wrong here. Uh, I, sh I should be able to reload this. And here it is. So this is just a visual representation of uh, the same of the same data that lives on the backend. So these are connected. These are not two separate things. These are separate processes, but these are not separate databases. The database of the backend is the same for the front end. That's uh, the whole point of that. So here I got my site. Uh, I created a site. I uh, chose my uh, the language. I checked PlonConf site, create, clicked create Plone site, then I saw that, and then I started, or even actually I did that before, I ran yarn start, and I saw my front page in the front end, and I can, I'll skip over these exercises, you should do them uh, at home, and then I see my, my, my site. Uh, I'll walk you through uh, the user interface, uh, the most important parts. Um, of the uh, of the site, so obviously we always we're always talking about when we talk about the uh, the visual representations, always the React user interface that we're using here, and we're talking about. So here you have the header around the site. There is a logo that is always a link to your site root. You have a automatically built navigation that is created from the content that is in the site. You already have some content, which is weird because you didn't create that. Plone did that for you. It's auto-generated content uh, that is created on uh, when installing Plone. And I'm going to delete that. And you should do the same. Just select everything. Uh, OK, uh, that, that was probably a bit too quick. Um, let's step back. Uh, so this is the navigation. Here's a site search. You can say, uh, I don't know, test should be 
findable because I created that. Um, you have a content area, which is, uh, here's a header. Um, here is a content area where you can just write stuff, save it, and it's visible. Uh, this is what you're editing when you when you edit stuff. And there is a footer that has some links that can obviously also be configured by you. And there is a toolbar to the left side, which has uh, the, the link that I just used to show you how to delete everything. That's a very important link. It's the link to contents. If you hoover over these icons, they explain to you what they're doing. Add, you can add uh, various content types. You have more where you can change the workflow, change the view, uh, inspect the history and stuff like that. We're going, getting through that. Most important one is add, uh, edit and contents. We're gonna use contents quickly to navigate to a, uh, a, a, a page where you can manage uh, bulk con content in bulk. Uh, there's here are breadcrumbs that you can use to navigate to the site route. I can select everything and I'm just going to delete everything. Just kill it with fire. So now my plone site should be empty, should only have this description here. If I do a hard, re that's caching involved, obviously. I did a hard reload there. So I get uh, got everything um, in the navigation, uh, just died and went away. So we covered the footer, the toolbar, edit folder contents and add. Uh, we're gonna ignore these for now. Um, yeah, very important. You also have um, <coughs> your, your portrait here. Um, you can log in and log out. Uh, there should be your photograph. Um, you can modify your profile and you have a link to the site setup where you can configure the site. So why am I not seeing this? And why does it say admin and not Philip Bauer? That's because we haven't created a user yet. And that's actually something you should do as a very, very first step. And we're doing that now, or you're doing that now, if you're following along. And um, so click on the, uh, on, on the picture here. So, um, okay, I skipped over that. When you uh, open your browser, uh, your site in your browser, you had to log in for the first time and the password is admin and this, the username is also admin. And please never use that in production. That would be pretty uh, stupid. Um, this is just for development. You can use admin or test one, two, three or whatever you fancy. But uh, if you ever uh, host a site on the internet, that is will certainly not be okay. So click on the uh, portrait, click on site setup. And here you have all these uh, links to various control panels and click on users and then create a new user. So how do you do that? Here is a small icon to the left where you can add a user and then pick your name. I'll use P Bauer, uh, I'll use mine, you use yours. Uh, Bauer at start.de. Password, I always use tester for these trainings because it's uh, it's five letters, it's lowercase, it's small. And uh, give yourself the role of, um, no, no, you can't. Uh, you can give yourself uh, a, a, any role, but not here, manager. Yeah, add yourself to the role of managers, of the, to the group of managers or to the, uh, oh, okay, complex. Add yourself to the group of administrators. Then you're an admin. And that's how um, I'll, I'll get to that, uh, how complex systems should be set up. Uh, you have groups, members go in groups and groups have roles. So every system does it that way. So this, this shouldn't be new to you. Everyone, everyone does it that, like that. So now I created this uh, user. I should probably save. No, I already have saved. So he should be there. Yes, he's there. Um, and now I can log out, hopefully. Here, log out and log in again as P Bauer tester. Login failed, super, why? Uh, let's see, maybe the default is 
the email address already? No. Did I do a typo? Crap. I seem to have made a typo somewhere. What's wrong? Does anyone know what I made? What I did wrong? I can always. Your press don't cancel. <laughs> What did I cancel? Oh, you you think I pressed cancel because I got my user here. He's he should be okay. Uh, I can delete that. I can delete me again. I'll just do that and create me again. Okay, username P Bauer name Bauer Hedstarsity Tester. Groups administrators. Hey, yes, administrators. Yes. Okay, let's see if it works now. User created. A uh, good idea is to have two browsers um, where you can log in as different users to try this stuff out and uh, not having to log in and out all the time. Yay, I obviously made a typo when I added, entered my password for the first time and Plone, yeah, we read that typo. And so I had no idea what my password was in the first place. So now uh, I can actually, I can really log out and log in as P Bauer. Yes, here I am. So now it actually says my tells me my name. I can edit my profile and add a picture here. I'm not going to do that. Uh, you're going to see enough of me. Uh, so here I am. I'm an administrator and I'm a real clone user. Excellent. I did my first um, first uh, job. So. Next up, um, we're not gonna configure a mail server, but for production purposes, you should do that um, because we have an add-on called products printing mail host. Um, we're not gonna send any uh, emails uh, during this training, hopefully, unless you disable this add-on, but you can, uh, you should, pro hang on. Why am I not, not seeing site setup and only my preferences? Because I, I don't seem to be an admin. I can't even add content. Uh, so yeah, so the thing is, not sure if that's to blame, probably not, probably I'm to blame because I couldn't uh, press enter probably uh, properly. Um, this training uses clone, six zero zero alpha one and that was released yesterday afternoon i don't know around four o'clock i saw that and uh i updated the training build out this morning to actually use this version so this is it's brand new and may have uh may still have issues uh maybe not maybe it does so maybe that's to blame maybe it's me probably me because uh this this alpha is pretty good. So I'll need to go to site setup again uh, and crap. go to groups and add myself to the group of administrators. Admin? Yeah. How do you do that? I'm not going to delete that group. Go away here. Okay. Um, this, this just uh, this changed in, uh, why can't I add a user to a group? Katya, can you tell me if that is something I missed? I'll, okay, I'll just make me a manager and save, um, but it should be in, in uh, the user interface should allow you, you to click uh, the group and edit the group. Uh, maybe there, but there's only delete and not edit. So add add users to a group. 
should be possible. I'll show you that. Um, the point is, if something is not working, you're not crap. Let's use another system. You can keep this system, even though it's alpha one, um, because all of this is also available in the back end. And you have a uh, list of users and groups and the same user we just created is here. And here's actually the link that I was looking for. You just click on that. And then you can say group memberships. And I wanna, yeah, I'm not, I'm only in authenticated users, but I wasn't added, probably I didn't press save at some point. So now I'm in the group administrators, which is uh, fine and I can, uh, I'm a manager because I'm in that group. So I'm inheriting that role. I'm actually, yeah. So now I should be uh, here when I reload. So this is a very important moment uh, where you learn about um, the power of these roles. Uh, I was a second ago, I was just logged in as P Bauer um, as a user. I had no permissions to do whatsoever. And someone changed my permissions and I uh, reload the page and suddenly I get all these icons. So now I'm a manager and I have the power to modify, change and create uh, content, add users and whatnot. So that is important. Um, but I, what I actually wanted to do is go to the control panel and get rid of the annoying error mes uh, message that you get at some point when you're not adding, oh, there's actually a default set now. Oh, that used didn't have didn't used to be the case. That's fine. So we have a default mail server that obviously doesn't exist because I don't have a mail server running on my laptop. Um, but that's that's fine. Okay, let's create some site structure because uh, that's like the first task at hand. Uh, that's a pro conference. People need to learn about the content uh, of that conference, talks, whatever, trainings, stuff. Um, without programming, we just use Plone to create some content. I will create a couple of folders here. Um, so, yeah, actually it says some of these need to be a page. Some of these should be a, um, a, a, a folder. So let's just change that text here. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter what I add here. Let's I can add some. You see, uh, while we're doing that, you see a interesting new editor. If you ever use Plone 5 or 4, this the editor looked much different. We're going to go into much more detail there, but we'll slowly, slowly approach that. So let's just create some uh, a page called training. OK, page training. And I'll just add some Latin nonsense a folder called schedule folder called schedule and you see it's a different uh different user interface how come that is weird you can think about that while i'm continuing to do that i'm not uh make sure that you're not adding because once I added the folder schedule or the page training, I was in training and in schedule. And if I create new content, it'll end up in there. But we want that in the site route. So click on the Plone logo before you uh, create the next item. This is the location page about sponsors. Oops, a page. Ah, come obviously. Here, page about sponsors. Again, different different user interface from folders. Page for sprints. Ah. Sprint and a page contact. Don't don't worry if you're not creating all of these. They, we're not using all of these. It's just a uh, for the whole story will be a useful set up if we do do a one week training which we're not going to do so this is how it should look like uh from your end and then once we did that in oh actually we we should have kept the uh a news folder i shouldn't that is stupid i removed that why is it as it, it doesn't say news here but in news um 
Katya, can you make a note that we update this part somehow? Yep. So I'll create a folder called news uh, where we add a news item uh, called conference website online. That's like the first thing we created a conference <coughs> website. So the order is weird. So let's change the order here. So again, we go to contents and we can just grab one of these items and move that to the top. News are the most important things. So they should be at the beginning. And here they are automatically at the beginning. And I'm going to create a news item, obviously. Uh, the title is this. Uh, let's add some nonsense text here and actually add an image uh, and a summary would be good. So you see the user interface is different from pages because you can keep that in mind already. Um, the editor for uh, all types except for pages is schema based uh, and only schema based and the and pages use a block editor, uh, block based editor. It also has a schema, but it's more. So this, this, by the way, it looks like not much, but this is a rich text editor here, this small field here. And you can uh, add all kinds of uh, stuff here. You can add uh, headings and subheadings. Let's say this is a subheading here. Um, here is a heading or subheading maybe. Uh, this is going to be uh, italics or whatever. And this is a link to something. Uh, well, my links here is a link. So I can select a link to something in the site, for example, to location and done. Uh, and when I save, this gets rendered and here's my link. So. Yep, this works as expected. Um, okay, I created a news item, then I'll add another news item just to uh, just to annoy you. News item, uh, submit your talks, more Latin nonsense. No, in, okay, let's add an image because it's so nice to add images. And um, so we have two uh, news items. Um, and now let's switch to a different browser and uh, log out. You, you don't have to do that. I'll, uh, I'll do that. How do I log out? Uh, am I logged out? I have no idea. Here I am, log out. Good. So I'm logged out. Where's my content? None of the content is actually visible because we only created the content. We haven't published the content. So Plone is a super secure system uh, in such a way that when you, when you edit, uh, add content and you don't publish it, there is no way, no way that uh, this content will be visible to uh, users um, on, that visit your website. Um, and that is uh, not that's because it's it's not like hidden away. And if you need if the if you know the URL, you will find it. For example, if you copy this here and you enter the this, it tells you no. This is this is not for you. Um, and Plone has a very very strong security record, and it's built in on object level. Each object has a couple of attributes that store. Uh, that define which uh, roles you have to have to be able to see this item. And uh, whenever something is, is traversed to, uh, Plone checks for these, uh, these roles. And you don't have to do that. This is, Plone does that for you. That's one of the reasons why uh, CIA and FBI are using Plone for their websites. I'm not sure if that's a positive recommendation or not, but I guess they're kind of security uh, sensitive, these organizations. 
So, yeah, um, also it should, we should have a folder called events, which we don't have yet. I'll create that. Uh, so you see a lot of additional stuff that you can add there. And in, in there, I'll add a event and you learn about another content type. Um, what's uh, the event deadline for talk submission? I know the dates are going wildly around like 2035, 25, 50, who cares? Um, so here you can add, add a start and end date for an event. Let's say this is on Monday um, because I used English as a language. Uh, the calendar seems to think that the beginning of the week is on Sunday, which I think is weird, but that's America for you. Um, 10 in the morning to four in the afternoon, that seems fine. Uh, there's also a whole day and open end and we'll figure out why that is there. Also, uh, still, I haven't finished talking about the publishing on content. If I reload this, none of this is still public. I will need to publish that, click on the three dots and switch it from private to public. You can also switch it to review, which is like a pending state where something is not visible to the uh, public. But if you have a more complex setup where you have more users um, with more different roles, you can easily uh, I'll show you the groups again. You see administrators, reviewers, reviewers. That's the ones that you want in this case uh, because you have a couple of people in your organization that are gatekeepers for content before it's published. That's what this uh, role is for. So this um, item is now public. The folder is now also public. And once I reload this site, I see events, but nothing else. And I can go, uh, I said there is a feature for bulk editing. I go to contents, I select everything, and I change the state, which is the uh, the um, the lights and I change it to publish and to everything that's in there and voila my whole website is public even my super secure intranet that I didn't want to have published so make sure you're actually only publishing the content that you want published because otherwise uh, you may have problems so here my news items are public i'm a anonymous user and i can see everything i can't edit anything i can't even pretend i can edit if i click, click edit this doesn't work i get an unauthorized exception okay um the default content types I already did that uh, but i'll show you the um the beauty, beauty of the editor again a little. So in the front page, uh, we have a, a page uh, type. Uh, actually, it's not a page type, but it's a page type-ish, doesn't, doesn't matter, where we have this blocks editor. And when you press enter here, you can add a new block. And this is a beautiful uh, and super powerful way to create uh, beautiful and uh, very different uh, layouts and uh, sites. You have these, uh, by default, a text block is created that you can just type to. And it's a rich text uh, editor again, where you can have all kinds of uh, difference. You have different styles, uh, call out, whatever type um, headings. Uh, you can add have lists and stuff like that. Um, but there are more than uh, these types. There are uh, image blocks where you can add an image. Let's upload an image and it should be, is there something in the story? Uh, what kind of image I should upload here? Probably a plone logo or something like that. <clears throat> Let's add a plone logo. It's uploading the image in the background and you can configure each block on the right side. There's a toolbar to the right. We can tell this block, okay, this should be small to the right. This should be hero sized uh, to the left or full width. I'll make that small. Uh, you can add a link uh, to that image and then you can save uh, the page and voila, yes, there's your 
uh, your image. And a anonymous users also sees that instantly. Okay, um, what else do we, uh, yeah, let's add a table like thingy here. Um, Here is a table, let's say stuff, whatever. Uh, this is a nice way to uh, have, have content in tables. And there are very powerful um, blocks uh, that contain dynamic content. In this uh, case, I added a, what is, did it say? Listing, a listing block. And the listing block is, it displays the results of a search that you define. So for example, here you say add criteria, I add all news items, for example, uh, matches any um, type is news item. And it automatically shows me while I click there, I already see the news items that I want displayed there. I can, uh, <laughs> change the variation where I actually have an image gallery or a summary view where I have these little pictures. I can change the sorting. I'll do that by publishing date, um, which is called effective, yeah, effective date, uh, reverse order. So the newest one is on top, uh, limited to five. So you don't get spammed and I save that. And I have a um, semi-beautiful uh, front page uh, with dynamic content in here. So this is the page content type, which has this, this, this powerful editor that is probably all you need to create uh, beautiful content. Um, but it also has uh, the schema uh, that I mentioned when I said schema-based content and the edit that the fields that you saw when you uh, when we edited a folder, you can expand that and you have all these fields that are defined in the schema available. So you can tag content, for example, uh, from page, whatever it is. It's now tagged as that. You can set the language if you have multiple languages in your site. You can add a link to something else as a related item. You set a publishing date and an expiration date and stuff like that and copyright information, uh, allow discussion and whatnot. Uh, a word of warning about publishing date. This is not workflow. So this, if you set the publishing date in the future, this doesn't uh, hide, it hides your content but it only hides you like this. Everybody knows you're there, but you actually, you think you're not, unless you're a cat. Um, but uh, so if the URL is, if you know the URL, you can access that. Uh, it's just not showing up in the navigation. Okay, so that is the, that's the page. A folder is obviously a folder, but only displays a title and a description and a, different can have different types of listings for the content inside that. So for example, the news uh, list news folder has a view called listing view at the moment. I can change that to summary view or tabular view or whatever. There's a couple of views that you can say, but this is, it doesn't have a rich text editor. You can't add a uh, rich text here. That's a folder. It is, you create it to, yeah to create structures. Uh, file obviously uh, is for binary data. Image obviously is for images. Event, you already saw that. Um, a link is also, uh, in sorry about that. I need to switch this off. Done. Um, a link is a, a, is a content type that can link to either internal or external content. So you can add a URL here, 
or you can select an item from the site that you link to. So it's a very powerful feature. And only if you are allowed to edit that link, you get redirect, uh, you see the link when you click on it, you go to the link and it points to this and there. But if you're not an editor, you actually automatically get forwarded to whatever the target uh, um, destination of that link is. So that's a super powerful thing to create uh, ad hoc uh, links to locations that are actually somewhere different than, uh, than wh where, you, where you are. A news item, you already saw that, that's basically, it's like a document, uh, like a, a page, just with an image and a different editor. Uh, so it doesn't have the blocks editor. A collection is, uh, we're not going to go into that. It's like the listing block, but as a content type. So there's a content type that does exactly, exactly the same thing as a listing block. Uh, and you, if you're asking, why do we have that? Um, that's because listing blocks don't exist in classic clone. In classic clone, when you go here, you, this is the same database. You see all the content that was just created by me here, deadline for talk submission with, uh, with date and time and the news items, including the images. So it's all, yeah, it's all the same. Um, this doesn't have the blocks editor, so it doesn't have a listing block. And a lot of sites are using, uh, still need to display uh, dynamic listings of content. That's where collections come in. Uh, for Vault, for Plone 6 with the uh, React front end, you probably don't use them. Okay, Let, we'll skip. Uh, you should read that content rules are so powerful, but we'll skip that because it's way too, uh, we have way too little time for that. Also, working copies are super cool. Placeful workflows are great. You can create a, a folder and say, this is a, this folder is called intranet and it has a different default workflow than the rest of the site. And this default workflow that you're configuring there doesn't have a published, published state. So this, uh, the, the, um, it only has, uh, I don't know, a private and internal. And so you only see this content when you're a logged in user. So it's a perfect intranet. So we have a lot of clients who have a website with Plone and have an intranet. And it's the same website, but it's a folder that has a work placeful <laughs> workflow where you're not, uh, not able to see uh, any of, that, of, of the content that is in there. Uh, so that's a powerful feature and a lot of other powerful features. If you don't know them, uh, read up on that. We'll just keep on going. It is already one hour past the uh, uh, 10 past four. I'd say, when shall we make the first break? Um, yeah, I don't know. Tomorrow, maybe. Uh, let's keep on going a little more, uh, like 20 more minutes. I, if I have, if if you don't have the attention span, just get some coffee and catch up what you missed on YouTube, or uh, yell at us in, in the in the in the chat. Um, I see Shaw had a, a question here. Uh, Paddy, can you can you look at that? And if it's important, we can discuss that in uh, in in the in the. Yeah, here. I have a look. Excellent. So, um, yeah, we could probably we could skip all that, but it's it's a bit it's not super unimportant. So, if you're new to Plone, this is important. Uh, Plone is has been around for twenty years. Yes, it's been the twentieth birthday of Plone. Uh, two or three weeks ago was the day, um, and. Like 20 years ago, there was no React or JavaScript framework. So it, it is obviously, it started as a backend system, uh, this one. Um, and it, it didn't start from scratch. It started as a user interface for a system called Zoop. Um, and Zoop actually also started as something uh, before, Bobo, and that's what it was called. And it actually had a, another third name, whatever. So it's um, Plone is, is sits on top of Zope, 
which is written in Python. So at the lowest level, there's Python, the programming language. On top of that is Zope. It's like an application server. If you know Java, Tomcat comes to mind, for example, as ex uh, ex uh, example. Then on top of Zope, there is CMF, which is Content Management Framework. So it's a framework to build content management systems. So if you if you um, if you know some computer uh, science uh, theory, it's like a factory factory. Um, and then uh, the whole thing on top of CMF, the content management framework, uh, sits Plone as a uh, which inherits like its multi inheritance. Uh, from CMF and from Zope and a lot of objects on top of that. It uses a database called CMF, uh, it's called the ZODB, Zope Object Database, and it's uh, it's not a relational database. It stores Python objects natively in the database. They're serialized as pickles. If you have never heard of pickles, it's in the standard library. It's a uh, it's a it's a way to serialize instantiated Python objects as stringish types. It's not meant for human consumption. You don't read that as a human, uh, but it works uh, great in the ZODB because you don't ever have to think about your database. You don't have to model uh, or manage your database. Obviously you need to back it up, but you don't have to, oh, we need to uh, write a, uh, your uh, schema for the relay object relation um, manage uh, object relation manager the ORM. So we store the objects directly without an uh, ORM, and there is no seam between the code and the database. This is an example how you actually store something you inherit from persistent. Not going to go into that, and it's super powerful. It used no SQL when that name was not even invented. It can uh, use uh, multiple uh, clients uh, that talk to the database and that's called Zio. It can replicate using a system called ZRS or alternatively you can use, um, you can use rail storage to store these pickles not in the ZODB, but in a relational database. Again, in Postgres or MySQL or MariaDB, you're not going to have tables with the, here's my title, here's my description, here's my relation to whatever, um, but you're going to have a Python pickle in there. So this is, again, not good to read for you, but it is well storage, so you can give it to your database admin to say, okay, you guy take care of replication because I'm, I don't want to be bothered with ZRS, for example. So that's powerful. And binary data obviously is not stored in the database, uh, the ZODB as strings, but stored as files in the file system. Uh, it's called blob storage, and that happens automatically. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into ZOP and CMF. There's a lot of history in here and nothing about pyramid. Uh, there's a lot of to be done. The important thing here and now is that Plone um, has, uh, for a couple of versions now, has a REST API and uses the REST API to decouple the, the back end and the database and the logic and the content from the front end that is called Volto. Um, we should probably write something in there. I'm not going to go into the history of Plone. If you want to discuss that, there is plenty of time during the conference. Uh, this is Plone 6. Uh, you'll see it while we talk about that. And it only runs on Python 3, obviously. So Python 2 is dead, dead, dead. But you can migrate to Python uh, 3 if you have a Python 2 uh, database. There are talks about that. Um, one is actually by me, I think, on Wednesday. Um, <coughs> Katya, I think that's one of your chapters, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. So I'll stop my screen sharing uh, and mute my. Hi again. So, uh, Plon 6, what is Plon 6? Uh, what 
this new which changes came with this version um philip already mentioned uh, the very important points so uh, what leads to me is um if you know plone five already i think the most of you do uh why is there a new version what's new um for me my personal opinion is that uh two important goals to uh, review to rework the uh the whole thing is uh to achieve a new editing experience um the editing experience means um how does an editor compose a page um there were um, several uh, add-ons in plone before and the meaning was uh, this could be easier. There are new techniques um, available, and we want to use it also in Plone to, um, yeah, as I said, to make the life of an editor a little bit easier. And um, Plone six itself with the Volto front end, as you've seen with Philip's presentation, comes with a um, um, uh, with an editor uh, that uh, not an editor, um, a way to edit pages uh, that use blocks where you can um, uh, break your text in blocks and uh, rearrange. This is uh, part of default uh, front end of Plone 6, but there are also already um, add ons which. I help you do even more uh, to compose a page with columns and so on. Um, and uh, besides the editing experience that I think is really improved is uh, that the development of a theme is much easier. Volto or Plone 6, uh, as you say now, uh, comes with uh, several helpers to customize the default theme. Mm, it's possible to customize uh, single isolated components and it's also um, a lot easier to um, customize uh, default components by the so-called component shadowing, which we, we will see in the next chapters. And um, yeah, I think these are two points that uh, are important for Plone 6. Um, about the details, um, I will skip the long list of cool things that comes with Plone 6, but maybe one uh, important point you have, um, as you've seen already, uh, two parts, back and front end, and these two do communicate via the REST API. There are default endpoints, uh, REST API endpoints, uh, which we can use when we develop with Volto or the Plone 6 front end. Um, uh, um, for example, if we uh, want to fetch data, we use the search endpoint, and we can also uh, create uh, add-ons uh, with um, custom endpoints if it, this is necessary to um, communicate in a special way with the backend. So um, yeah, there are a lot of helpers to um, make the life of a developer easier. Um, two more, yeah, component shadowing I already mentioned. Um, the other one which I want to mention and um, uh, talk about in the after the next chapter is Semantic UI. This is also a, a cool helper um, for making the code a little bit um, yeah, um, to enhance the readability of the code. Uh, because Semantic UI or the um, corresponding React package, Semantic UI React, comes with uh, helper components for um, uh, 
small things you don't want to write uh, again and again, like buttons, drop down menus, and so on. But um, we will see this in uh, one of the next chapters, uh, not in detail, but um, a short overview what um, you can find there um, and where to look for these helpers to avoid uh, writing um, simple um, code again and again, and to concentrate on the important things of your add-ons of your apps in Clone 6. And um, <clears throat> um, one more thing in this chapter I would like to uh, mention is um, the question if you want or if you need to switch to Plon 6 or if you can stay with Plon 5 or even stay with Plon 4. And I think um, uh, it's recommended to, uh, to use uh, the to use the new um, front end. And um, the question, uh, if uh, switching with an existing project, I think it depends um, if there are add-ons that can help you to realize what you want to achieve, or if it's, um, process, uh, if it's possible to, to implement um, that what's missing. And um, for me, it's important to, to realize that you can use existing clone add-ons, backend add-ons, uh, as long as they are doing business logic, as long as they do not touch the UI. So uh, they are still uh, valuable and um, they are there and uh, there's a, huge ecosystem of clone add-ons and uh, the corresponding side, the ecosystem of uh, Volto or Plon 6 add-ons will is growing constantly. So yeah, I think it's worth thinking about. Thank you. Philip, do you want to continue with customizing Volto components? Sure. Um, good. So actually, before we customize Volta components, we'll quickly cover configuring customizing clone through the web. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail here. You should just click and see what's there or read the documentation that is here. Um, and uh, I will uh, show you a couple of the most important things uh, that uh, there are. Uh, so when you go to um, the site route, sorry for that, uh, you have this link to the site setup and you have the control panel and there you can configure obviously the date and time and also, yeah, the first weekday. Excellent. I like Mondays. Actually, I don't, but for the first day of the week, Mondays is my favorite choice. Uh, I can configure languages. You can have multiple languages. We're not going to go into detail there. You uh, set your mail uh, server and user. You configure the navigation, which items should be shown up in the navigation, and which are, should not show up, and so on. Uh, you can configure the search, what items should uh, not show up in the search, and so on. Here's the most important one, site, where you say what's the title of your site. For example, uh, site title is Plone uh, Conference 2035. In this case, I can add a site logo. You can't up upload that here. That is only for Plone Classic. Uh, you see this is a base 64 encoded uh, string. Um, I already uploaded that in Plon something in Plon Classic. You'll see it soon. Um, you can configure lots and lots of things here, including a uh, JavaScript snippet for statistics and stuff like that. Uh, save that. 
uh, go back. Um, then there's social media, uh, the Volto URL of the Volto site uh, that should be configured. That's something for hosting. You can install and uninstall add-ons. We'll do that pretty soon. Uh, you can actually inspect the database and see how many items there are in your database and where they where it lives you see it lives in backend var file storage datafs that's your zodb database that's where it is um and there's a lot of other things well i'm not going to go into detail because we're going to uh, see some of these later and there most of them are discussed here especially the ones that are not there and that's what's important here so this is the control panel in volto and here is your control panel in classic clone. I just uploaded a logo and you see that here, mastering clone. And here it doesn't say mastering clone because um, yeah, it uses a different, uh, the rendering is different there. And that's in the next chapter, we're gonna customize the logo that shows up here. Um, here you have the same uh, control panels plus some more because some, don't make any, it doesn't make sense to have them in Volto. And maybe there may be even others that are not yet implemented in Volto. Uh, I think everything that's important is already there. But for example, the theming control panel for Plone Classic uh, doesn't make any sense in Volto because we're not going to use, it's a completely different theming setup. It doesn't make sense to use a Diazo theme, if you know what I mean, in Volto. So this doesn't exist in Volta because it wouldn't make uh, any uh, wouldn't make sense. And also in Plone, you have access to the Zoop user interface called Zoop Management Interface, ZMI for short. And there are even more in-depth um, things that are uh, that you can use mostly as an admin or a developer. So you will certainly spend time there and we will go there today uh, at a later stage, for example, to inspect the portal catalog, which is the search engine that is built into Plone. And we can see representation of all the content that I already created and uh, how it can be found in, uh, in, uh, using the search, you see the search bar here. This uh, uses this catalog and it has a couple of indexes that we can use and you can create new ones. There's a lot of complexity and a lot of power there. Um, we're not gonna use much of that, we're gonna skip ahead. And I suggest since we already spent one and a half hours to make a five minute break, uh, or let's say seven minutes to actually be able to uh, visit the restroom and get some coffee before we customize the first Volto component where we're going to change the logo and a couple of the views or the, the display way, ways items are displayed. And there we're actually going to use the editor and some real development. And so we're, there we're jumping in. But before that, you can steal yourself with uh, your uh, poison of choice. I'll get some coffee. And um, we will meet you in, let's say, seven minutes, okay? Uh, if you have questions so far, please put them in Slack and we'll find time to answer that before the next uh, um, slot. I'll mute myself. Uh, we'll, uh, in, the, in the recorded video, this, will, this break will be just mentioned as break and you can skip to the next part because uh, we'll probably be too lazy to edit the whole breaks out of the video. Doesn't really hurt.
Yep. Um, I think we should continue. So, no tough questions in the Slack. Um, let's continue. So next we're customizing some things um, that we're seeing in the browser for uh, our users. So this is a front end chapter in the documentation uh, of the training. You see these sidebars here at the beginning of a chapter that specify if a chapter is dealing with the front end or the back end. And if you're dealing with the front end, obviously you need to go to the folder front end and cha make changes here. And if you're dealing with the back end, you need to go to the folder back end. And if you add some, if you want to follow that training, uh, but lost something uh, of the code or you did made an error, you can't recover that. You can use this uh, more info uh, link here to find out how you can check out uh, the code from a certain chapter um and uh use that chapter uh to start uh the beginning uh, or at the end of this chapter see what what's the result of uh, what should be the result of that uh to customize um a visual representation of what you're seeing in uh in plone in in volto we use a, a technology called uh let me it's a bit ugly, I'd say. Uh, so, yeah, I would love to hide some things, but I'm not going to go there. Okay, we're using a, a, a technology that allows us to override existing uh, items. Uh, and you'll see that, that, that pattern over and over again, uh, that we're not forking Plone or download Plone to your hard disk and change everything, uh, whatever you want. Uh, I heard that is what you were supposed to do with some other systems, uh, at least a couple of years ago, that don't have a system uh, where you can override features. Uh, in uh, React, that's called component shadowing. And it allows you to create a copy of uh, the set, uh, an item that you want to modify in a certain container, in a certain folder, and it will be um, automatically found on startup, and it will replace the component, uh, the file uh, that you want to, uh, that you're overriding with. Um, so that is pretty, pretty uh, nifty, and it's basically the same as what you do did in classic plone using a add-on called jbot just a bunch of templates where you just re add a, a copy of a file into a certain folder following a certain pattern and uh, on startup it's discovered and it replaces the original file that is shipped with plone um, there is also i should uh, mention that uh, in this sidebar, there's a link to uh, solve the same requirement in classic Plone. So if you follow that link, uh, you'll see a broken navigation because this item is not part of the navigation, but you will do the same tasks or similar tasks in classic Plone. In this case, uh, the logo is already done in the chap early, earlier chapter, so we don't need to do that in, in Plone Classic. But here we're modifying the news item template and the listing template. It's all discussed here how that works in classic Plone. And it says classic UI. Uh, but we are going all in with Volto. So we're using uh, this uh, component shadowing technology to modify uh, this um, the, the logo in this uh, as a first step. Uh, you can download the logo here. It's on our website. Um, it's just a, a SVG file. It's not very uh, um, exciting. Just says mastering plone in some crazy font. Um, so what you need to do is you need to fire up the editor of your choice. I use VS Code. 
Um, and I will actually use two instances of VS Code. So I already have one terminal here, one for the back end, one for the front end. And I'm going to fire up a new one, a third one, where I go into uh, training plus six. That's where I have that front end. And I say code dot, which is starts up uh, VS Code for me. And it opens the front end folder in uh, for me here. So I have two different editors uh, that I can switch back and forth from. Um, that is just to, I don't know, make it easier for me. Uh, you already have, upon installation for the training, you already got the um, uh, this, this whole site set up. Um, and we're gonna follow the documentation here to add stuff into our uh, front end setup. The front end setup that we have here does not contain Volto. We didn't download Volto and started Volto. We actually created a package uh, that depends on Volto. So in this case, uh, as there is Volto installed, but not in SRC. SRC is a, uh, a bunch of empty folders. So there is nothing here. Uh, and it, uh, in, in your package, JSON, this package that you created depends on Volto. That's here, dependencies, plon Volto, uh, version 14.00 alpha 23. So that's the newest alpha of Volto, I think, that we're using here. And uh, by building that using yarn uh, install, uh, Volto got installed. And there is a couple of uh, nifty uh, things in, 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 in this package that makes sure that Volto is actually available in a folder called Omelette. And in there, Omelette, SRC, I don't know, let's say, uh, uh, actions or components, more importantly, uh, theme, uh, I don't know, breadcrumbs. Here, this is Volto. This is the real Volto. You shouldn't change that because that is the equivalent of checking out Volto and changing it on your uh, uh, directly. You, we want to override that. So we're not changing Volto in the omelet directory. We're extending it uh, and overriding it in our SRC folder. This is our package. This is our thing. It's called cloneconf minus Volto. I think that's the name uh, of the source checkout that we're using here. So we're using, um, we're going into the front end packet uh, folder and using this path and name to download uh, the logo as uh, to add the logo SVG SRC customizations components theme logo. Okay, I'll copy that. I already have a SRC folder, customizations, uh, components, and that's empty. So I need theme and logo as a path, and I can add that uh, like this, which is nice. Um, components theme logo and inside logo, I'll just open that in uh, Finder. Here is my folder. Um, if I go up, you see the uh, structure customizations, components, theme, logo, and inside logo, I'll just dump uh, the SVG that I just downloaded. Bam, so it's here. And I should see it here. Doesn't uh, VS Code doesn't have a preview for SVG, so I could edit it if I wanted. I'm not going to do that, obviously. And now I need to restart Volto. Um, is anything unclear about that? I guess not. We could just stop Volto using Control C and Yarn Start, which will take a while. But um, while that happens, um, I can. Uh, discuss, what should I discuss? There's nothing to discuss actually. Um, so it's important to, uh, you need to really restart 
your front end instance, the, the process that is running the front end, when you add something in a, a customization, when you modify, uh, add um, existing code, you don't have to do that. The development mode of the um, of, of, of the JavaScript application makes sure that it's automatically re, uh, recompiled and your browser is actually automatically updated. Uh, it shows the, uh, the right stuff. Uh, but in uh, if you add a file, you actually need to restart that. And it takes a while to compile and now it's done. And once I reload, I should actually, yeah, already, I already see it there, it says master and clone. So yay for us, uh, that is something we already did. So now you made a change. So you guys are prof professional developers or actually you wanna be. So if you go into the front end folder, so you have this uh, training clone six, you go into front end and you say, git status and tells you, hey, there is a new folder, a new thingy here that you sh could commit. That is what you should do now. You shouldn't do that during the tr this training because it's already all, all, everything is already there, but you should um, now uh, make a commit and say, okay, cost add logo uh, and there you are. And that's, uh, so that change is in your Git history. Okay. Uh, this was the logo, that was the easy part. Now let's go to the footer. Why are we not dealing with the footer? So there's no, we're not changing the footer, obviously. Um, maybe that heading should go away. Let's change the news item view. So why do you want to change the news item view? That's something that's bother, been bothering me uh, forever and ever and ever. So um, you visit a website, and you go to the press release or news section and you click on a news section, a news item, and you see it and say, yeah, that's really nice and exciting. You have a new board member or you have a new release, but <clears throat> what's missing? When was that? Wasn't that, wasn't that like 2015 and your site is super out of date? Or is that super recent? Was that a new release uh, that was just made uh, yesterday? So um, what's missing by default, which is, I still don't know why that is. Uh, it's probably so we don't have to change this training and keep uh, can keep editing news items in Plone Classic and Plone uh, in, and in Volto. Um, so we can display the date here. So what we want to have here is the date that this new item was actually published. Let's do this. So um, first we need to find out where the actually news item is rendered. Um, so the news item is, yeah, that's a bit tricky when I'm not going to go into there uh, that how to find that. Um, but I'll just take my word for it. It is in Omelette where Volto exists, source, components, theme, view, news item view. It's a same folder structure. And if you, it would be probably, since you know what the uh, content type is called, you could just search for news item. Uh, hang on, why doesn't it find anything? News, um, that is weird. News item, files to include, files to exclude. Why is my search not uh, in all files? I seem to have misconfigured my search uh, somehow, but uh, I'll find it by hand. Uh, it is in SRC components theme view. And here are all my content types, news item views. So here's my component. It's a React component. And I want to customize that. So how do I do that? I copy the whole file into a, uh, into a different folder. So this is the file. Let's, we can look at that actually a little bit. And you can see have your first glance at uh, a Volto um, view uh, in React. So it has some a couple of imports and it uses the object that you're looking at, so the news item, which is 
like this here, the whole, the, the thing that you can edit, the thing that lives in the content tree under this, uh, in this branch, uh, and this a leaf on this branch, probably. Uh, this is uh, the uh, content in this case. And it's passed to the news item view, and this creates some HTML basically uh, using uh, the, yeah, that's JSX for you. I'm not going to go into detail um, how, how, that, how that all works, but it's basically uh, one example here. If there is a content title, so if the object has an attribute title, then render the h1 tag uh, class name. You see, this is not HTML like per se. This is React. So you can't use class because in JavaScript, that is a reserved statement. It needs to be class name and pass uh, use document first heading as class name and replace the content of that with content title and then content subtitle and whatever. Uh, there is more stuff in there and then there's the description and then there's the image. You see the image here that is uh, using a, a, the image that is not a HTML tag called image because you remember HTML is called IMG. The image is a component from semantic UI that is used here to render the image and you pass some arguments here, the title, and the SRC, which is automatically created, it creates a URL for that uh, for that uh, image. And floated equals right is also not a classical HTML uh, tag. Uh, it is a argument for the image component that is used here. So this is how the view looks like, and it exports as uh, the news item view and has these prop types um, that you probably know when you do React development. If you're just overriding stuff, this is something you do not yet need to know. You just need to be able to understand the basic logic of that, saying that if the content has an argument, has an attribute called text, then render uh, that text att uh, attribute as dangerously set inner HTML. That's one of my most favorite um, words here. So this is a React uh, built-in thingy, obviously, and uh, that renders then the content text data, which is the real HTML that is returned from the, uh, from the REST API. So here we have the view. Uh, now we want to modify that. So we copy this, the whole thing, into a, uh, yeah, oh, there's, you should probably read that because that's, uh, that's really interesting because we, we should look at that just quickly. Um, do I have, I hope I have my developer tools enabled. Um, so why doesn't it, oh God. I don't have my developer tools enabled. Uh, Katya, I guess you will have to do that uh, in your later chapter. I seem to have disabled my React developer toolbar. Doesn't really matter. We can uh, redo inspecting an item in a later chapter. Uh, but it, it, it read that and it's, uh, it's important and it helps you to figure out where that component actually lives and how it works. So copy this file into customizations, components, theme view. So customizations, components, theme view. Do we have that already? Let's see. So in our, not in omelet, please. Uh, so close that. Customizations, components. And then in components, we need more. We need a folder called theme view. That's here now so here is theme and view and then there we need the news item and i'll just copy uh i could can i copy the whole file probably can if i find it here where's my news item view here copy <coughs> and i paste it in this folder paste here I have it. So again, I need to restart. 
uh, I'll do that. And I don't get a message that, hey, I found a new customization. You'll just need to see that this happens. Uh, and now very important, uh, happens to me like every two weeks, don't modify the original because now you have both items open, modify your copy. Um, yeah, it's confusing when you have an editor and the same file open twice. Make If you're uncertain, make sure that it starts with SRC customizations, then you're in the right place. And how do you find out uh, that this is actually the one uh, that is then rendered? Uh, once startup is finished, it just takes a little while. Um, so obviously just add some nonsense to it and that is visible in the site. So let's see, let's just... Add a H1 saying, hello world. So once I reload, I hope I didn't get an air, yeah, still starting up. It has interesting messages, which I will just ignore. And here we already see it. Hello world. Yes, I actually already customized that. If I wouldn't make uh, these uh, stupid change like this, it would look exactly uh, like the original. So without uh, hello world. And you see, I just saved. And upon saving, uh, this is the message that I get. It does a, a reload. It re reloads the site, uh, the, the code. So, okay, uh, good. So what was the task? We should add a date. We could just type a date there, but that's stupid. We're not going to do that. So the content, I already said that, is the item that we're looking at, the news item, uh, submit your talks. And the news, I this item has, um, okay, I should really add this, uh, enable this feature because this is really important now. Where is my uh, React? Uh, oh, I could just use Chrome for that. No, I'll just do it. Uh, developer toolbar, I think that's what it's, oh, can't type. Um, this is not it. Come on, React. Developer tools here, this one. You need this. You need this. No questions asked. You just need that. This is this is super important uh, when you're developing um, for uh, Volto or any kind of React uh, stuff. And it's already there. Here's my developer toolbar. It says this. Hey, it's development build. Uh, and now I can inspect. Uh, my components, not the HTML, but actually the React components, I can inspect them and I can inspect uh, lots of things. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but this is like the, the code. Here is my news item view. And inside this news item view, when I, at some point I find it, it's pretty complex tree, but here's the news item view component and it has a content object, and this is this. This, con this is the news item view, and it has a content uh, attribute property. It's a prop, actually. And in this con prop, uh, in these properties, uh, now in content, in the property content, there is a lot of stuff, and we will figure out what we're going to need from that. And I already found it. So for example, it, a lot of stuff is used here already. So type is the news item. There's somewhere is probably the title. Title here, submit your talks. Here's the text, which is a object itself and it has data. You remember I said this is data that is rendered down here, content text data. Um, so this item doesn't have uh, any text. Let's add some text. So it'll actually show up uh, and make that a bit more interesting, uh, by at least adding one HTML tag. 
And now where's my view component? Da -da -dum -dum. I lost my component. Uh, hang on, news item. You can search, which is super useful. So here's my news item view, it has content. And here now the text should be more. So we have data actually holds the HTML uh, that is passed uh, from the backend via the REST API uh, to the React application that's running here. So what do we need from that? We need don't need the text because we already have that. We want effective in this case. This is a date and it's automatically the date that is used by Plone, no, created, we use created. It's the creation date. Uh, there are a couple of different dates. Obviously there's like the date you were born, there's the date you got your driver's license and the permission to drink alcohol. And these are different dates and um, depending on uh, for content, it's also, uh, if, if you write a news item, but you only publish it two weeks later, you need to talk to your client what should be visible there because every client has a different idea what should be visible there and what should be visible if the item is not yet published and stuff like that. So there's, there's huge complexity. And there's also the modification date. So if you have a news item from 2015 and someone changes a typo, um, is it suddenly a super new news item if you use the modified date? Yeah, so uh, you see that's pretty complex. Um, so created is the date we want here. So let's just use this, um, this thing and add that here, uh, content.created and save. And I don't need to do anything else because after I pressed save, uh, you see this automatically happened and this automatically happened. I even had, didn't have to reload my browser. So that's modern JavaScript development for you. The tool chain is really, really good. Uh, the result obviously is total crap because this is nothing a human can read, but it is, it is a date. It's a visual representation of a date. Um, we'll use uh, JavaScript to fix that. We could do some nifty string replacement and changing, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we use uh, the power of the vast ecosystem of JavaScript libraries. And one is the moment library. We'll import moment from moment uh, at the top here. And it, if you have a good editor, it tells you, hey, you, got, you, ins, you imported something, but you're not using that. Please get rid of it. We'll use it in a second, be calm. And then uh, pass that uh, attribute uh, that, uh, where did we put it? Actually after the image, not before the image. Um, pass it here and move it after the image, before the text. And don't, do we need a paragraph? Oh, we want a paragraph around that. Okay, save. And if you, again, if you have a good editor, uh, it automatically uh, takes care of indentation and form a uh, code formatting. So we're passing this uh, date um, um, object to the moment, it's actually a string, to the moment um, library and passing it a format. LL is one of the, uh, default formats that you can use. You can read up uh, all about that in the in the documentation for the moment JS library. Um, we're not going to do that. I'll just I didn't I didn't have to reload, and automatically we have this. So that's excellent. We, we're already done. We have the date, um, and yeah, that's it. I think yeah we have a date. Excellent. So here is a whole dis, uh, d discussion about what, what happens uh, with these uh, dates. Um, I'm gonna use the solution here. So use effective if there is effective, otherwise use created. So this is basically a try except uh, or if else statement, um, save. And the editor even makes these nifty space thingies here which are ugly. I still hate JavaScript with a vengeance, but it is, it is a lot of fun developing with it. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's it. We did our first uh, customize second customization, the logo and the news item view. We have a uh, a date here. So you visit your website and you see the list of talk, uh, the list of uh, news, and you realize something. Yeah. Uh, why is it blue? Okay, let's get rid of the blue. That's just selection nonsense. Oh, because I clicked here. Interesting. Can I unclick that? Probably, yeah, like this. So I have my news and here I have my date, but in this view, I don't have a date. Ah, darn. Okay, one more view to customize and another uh, task for you. So this case, we're customizing the summary view. That is not a view for one content type, but a view that is um, a sign uh, that is usable on uh, on folders as there's more than, what I want to say is there's more than one view for folders. You can go to a folder and say, hey, I want to look at this and as a listing or as a summary. In this case, we'll use the summary view. Otherwise, our changes will not show up here. So, and again, we can ins use the, uh, the inspector here to find um, the component that is used, uh, summary view, here it is. And now we can, um, we, here's the, uh, wow, there's the code. How do we, what happens here? Nothing happens if I click here, interesting. So summary view is the name of the game and I can uh, use my search, which is not working again. Why is it, not? yesterday it worked, oh, now it works. View. No, it doesn't work anymore. I have no idea what's uh, what's wrong there. Probably I configured it to not follow symbolic links or something like that. Uh, my editor. So um, I'll look for the summary. If you, if you please fix your search, if you have the same issue as I do, it's in the same folder actually. Uh, so here's my summary view. I'm just gonna copy the whole file and drop it into the same folder, paste, 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 paste. Where's paste? Paste here, summary view. So now I added this file and again, I need to start up. I'm gonna skip through this part, but um, yeah, no, I'm not gonna skip through that because that's important. While I explain something, I'll restart. So. Uh, you remember I said that in the news item view, the, com the view component was uh, passed the uh, argument content, which is the content object uh, that we're looking at, uh, the instance of a news item uh, that we're looking at directly. In news, in summary views, we're also looking at a content object, but the content object is actually not the news item, but a folder that contains these news items. And inside this, uh, the summary view, uh, the logic is, iter uh, the, the code is iterating over the argument items or the property items of content. So content, which is the folder, obviously has something called items. And we're doing like four item in items. I always try to read JavaScript as if it was Python because I really, really prefer Python uh, to that. And then we have item is one of these items uh, in the list of things that are displayed there. And then these again have URL, title, image, description, text, and whatnot. So the same applies to item that used to apply uh, to, oh, again, I have two summary views open. Don't modify the wrong one. Close the origin, original. So after I uh, re restart finished, so if I, ah, I can, let's let's try that. That's going to be fun. Um, I, I, oh, I already did that. So I'm not going to do that again. I just copy and paste my code in here and put it, uh, I don't know, somewhere here under the, before the description, under the description who cares, and save and say, hey, we're done, it's all good. Uh, reload the whole thing, because it realized 
will broken. And there, there we are. So uh, moment is not defined. Uh, didn't import moment. Yeah, it's true. Import moment. Here we are. Reloading again. See these. No, I have no idea what it's doing there. It's but it works. It's excellent. So and here we are. So imagine next week you add a new item. Everything has the same date. That's the error you just made or that I just made. Is I use content effective and not item effective, and that is uh, yeah. Everyone does that, and uh, everyone has to go through that uh, pitfall uh, to pick the wrong uh, wrong item again. So uh, yeah, that's 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 the solution here that we're using. Save item created, item effective, same uh, display uh, display format. If we'd have news items that have a different creation date uh, and publishing date, then uh, the date would change. So the question now um, comes up, can you actually, can you do that? Yes, you can. So imagine the conference website was already online last week. You can just go there and in dates, you say, hey, the publishing date, that's what we want to display. That was a Monday, we were pretty early, so save. And when I reload this, uh, when I hard reload this, hopefully, hey, okay, October 17, that is correct. So that was the date that I selected, but for the, uh, for this view, maybe some crazy caching is happening there because uh, I fixed the code, it says item effective or item created and item effective is what we're displaying. So this, I would say this is a caching issue and I'll just, it's always good to kill things by restarting it and figure out, uh, find out if that if that is the issue before you do further debugging because uh, cache invalidation and naming things are the two hardest things in IT. Uh, and this would be number one, cache invalidation. This, uh, hopefully it was that. Um, let's go further. Um, we'll skip this, uh, this uh, next part where we, uh, let's see if it happens here. So reloading, um, you can do that at home. We also have a listing block. Um, actually, we should do that, but it'll cost a, it'll cost time that we don't have. So we're not doing that. In the next uh, block here, thirteen six, we will we would customize the listing block. You remember, we use the listing block on the front page to display news items. So the uh, thing with the cache invalidation is obviously wrong. What? is going wrong here. So did I modify the wrong file? Oh, yes, I did. I, I, yeah, exactly what I told you not to do. No, not, sorry. Again, customizations. Katya, do you have any idea why that, why, why that's happening i thought first it is a typo but the uh, the spelling is okay yeah i think so too let's add fool see if i made something a stupid mistake foo shows up item should be okay i have no idea it should work um just tell your client it should work that's always good enough no, it's not. Uh, let's move on. It, 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 it actually, it works. Pretend it works. So in the next chapter, we would modify the, uh, the listing block, which we have here that we can use to display if we, um, hang on, 
if we edit that to actually display our news items that are here and we want to show up the uh, the date here as well and that's what we're doing in this chapter and the tricky thing here is this is not a view for a content type so it lives in a different place it lives in components manage blocks, listing, default templates. So that's a bit hard to figure out. You can figure it out using the debug, uh, the, um, the uh, React developer tools. Uh, see that it's, hey, there is something called default template and that's probably, probably what's used here. And then you can customize that. Um, a lot of the uh, knowledge, what to change, uh, you can just remember, learn, but it, De debugging is is a is just you you can it's not a problem you sh you can uh, totally do that just change some file uh, put some typo in a file and see if uh, if if something happens so if I look at uh, the default template JSX I'm not going to do that now and see if you if you add something and it ch and, and it changes in your browser you're obviously editing the right file. And then you can copy that into your customizations and do a proper change and make a, a commit in your Git history so that everybody can figure out that it's you who did this change. And if you've did that, um, then this will happen. Just um, a short note. Yes. Um, I think it's uh, important to, uh, uh, it's worth noting that uh, if you want to find out uh, what you have to customize, uh, for example, this, Default template, the um, React developer tools uh, are very useful because everything is a component. And if you find with the developer tools the component here uh, by yeah this uh, search thing, um, then uh, most of the time you know the file name that you have to customize because this is most of the time corresponding uh, component name and file name. Here's source, it actually says listing body JSX, it even tells you the line uh, line number. And uh, yeah, but there is uh, there is more with blocks extensions, anonymous, default view, this is, yeah, whatever. Um, inject Intel, yeah. Lots of a uh, lot of stuff to uh, discover here. Um, let's one pretty important thing that we're not dealing in the, in the whole training, um, except for this small part. We're not dealing with internationalization. Uh, in this part, we do because we want display is uh, a date is displayed. In, in different languages in a different way. So in, in English, um, it says October 23rd, and in German, it would be 23. October and so on. So, and people, even though a, uh, um, a website is, uh, is in English, um, people would probably want the dates to be displayed in a uh, way that they actually understand that. And to do that, we can use uh, this React Intel internationalization um, stuff and uh, pass uh, set the locale uh, that is used by the site. If you have a multilingual site, that's super important. Or uh, the browser sets that, and then uh, then the moment uh, moment JS automatically uses that. Um, we're not going to do that now. You can do that at home if you fancy that. Uh, let's go to the next chapter about semantic UI. Katya, take it away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, semantic UI, uh, we already heard about it. It's a little helper on a big helper for developers uh, to <clears throat> uh, concentrate on the important things and to use the components that semantic UI or semantic UI React um, provides. Um, uh, these components are things like buttons, labels, 
um, help us to structure the page by uh, so-called containers to to have boxes with a already prepared uh, um, padding and margin and so on and so um, I skip to the chapter talk where we have uh, where we will <clears throat> create a view for our content type talk. And this would look um, something like this, where we have uh, a label uh, for the um, audience of the talk. Uh, and we take the component label from semantic UI, uh, which will, um, yeah, which is, um, um, something like a widget with a uh, theming and we can easily um, choose a variation of it. For example, in this case, the color or also the shape and so on. And so you take the component from semantic UI, um, modify some attributes and it looks fine and you can concentrate on your um, main part of your development and also uh, very often used as the container. And uh, that's the bottom part of this page. You see a box with a border and the um, uh, padding most of the time is okay. So is, you can put your uh, content um, that you want to display in this container and yeah, you have a structured page. So this is our semantic UI. It comes with um, Volto default. And also the default theme is relying on this uh, React package uh, based on semantic UI. So you, if you use it, your, um, your modifications fit in well to the default theme called Pastanaga. And when we now step to the next chapter where we want to do some small customizations, not writing own components or customizing as we've seen in the last chapter, but only uh, modify the yeah, some uh, CSS style, then we can, well, I do have my chapter, oops, yeah, theming. Then uh, a one um, typical example is to change the font name, uh, the font or the font size or what do I have here, letter spacing. Then uh, we can uh, write an own CSS rule and um, we will see now where we do it and that we can use uh, predefined variables like in this case, font name. And for this, see where we customize. Um, I should, do I have to change the sharing? Um, sorry for interrupting. Uh, I think you you're not clicking on your browser. Sorry, ich hör dich nicht. Um, I think you're clicking on the browser uh, with a video and not the real browser. I don't get it. I have the, the uh, now I'm sharing the Firefox. Yeah, but you, you um, click with your mouse and drag. Drag. Yeah, that is the video. You're look. You you you're looking. You're clicking on the Zoom uh, window and not on the Firefox window. On the you're clicking on the Firefox in within Zoom. Minimize your Zoom window and then you have the browser and you can.
Okay, so you now should see my editor. Um, <clears throat> uh, the theming is done. Um, we have seen the omelet folder for the Volta code, and beside the source code, the where we have uh, components, actions, reducers, and so on, we have a, a folder called theme. Is my editor now share? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we have the folder theme and uh, with Walter, uh, we have the Pastanaga theme and also the default theme. Uh, default means that this is what uh, Semantic UI provides. Pastanaga is the theme of Volta or Plon6. And it um, comes with some uh, variables and uh, CSS rules. And uh, if you want to, for example, customize the font, um, we will find a variable here. And um, uh, we have not one big uh, CSS file, but it's um, organized by topics and uh, something like font which is uh, yeah, a global thing we find in the global folder. And um, most of the files here are pairs, uh, a pair of a variable file and an overrides file. Um, variables is clear. We find um, uh, our font, font name variable, which we can modify to change the font. And we have um, the other part of the pair um, the, uh, overrides. And in this case, it's empty. Normally, you will find uh, CSS rules here. So um, this is uh, what comes with Volto. If you want to override, we uh, create a new file with the same name and use the path. On top here, we see the path. Uh, we take the path from the theme name on, so uh, globals, and then our, I want to override site overrides, uh, globals, we create a folder globals and the file site overrides. I won't do that now because it's really easy to do. And yeah, then we change the variable name and the other case would be that there is no variable and we want to place a custom CSS rule. So we take the part uh, site overrides. If it's global or if it's something like um, in collections, we have uh, menu, table, forms, very important form overrides then we uh, can pick uh, the matching rule here. And we also uh, look at the path again. We are in collections, uh, file form override. And then we go to our, uh, our app code. I close the omelet and I close the source part of our app and at the same level as the source folder, we have a theme folder and we change to this. And um, I already prepared two folders, globals folder where you find the customized uh, site variables. And here I have my font name changed to uh, Leto. Um, this is a font name of um, Google font. Um, if we use a Google font, we can just modify here the variable, uh, the value. And Volto cares about um, getting the source from Google font from, from the Google font website. Um, and yeah, this would be the way to change the font. And the other one would be, uh, for example, to customize the letter spacing. Then I create the, the other part of <clears throat> the site modifications, uh, site overrides. 
and I place my CSS rule here. And then, yeah, as we uh, created new files, um, we have to start what again, and then the modifications can be seen. And yeah, I think it's easy. Um, questions? If not, I would hand over to Philip again. Thank you. Um, wow, that was quick, uh, the seeming part. Um, let me share my screen. I found out that we have a bug. We have a bug in Volto. Um, and we should have realized that a bit sooner because when we changed uh, the view to summary view uh, here from or in this case <coughs> summary view, um, the picture uh, the the, the, uh, the pictures here, the uh, images didn't show up. You see? There's no images, but in the template, um, there is an image tag. Uh, and the objects obviously have an image, but they're not showing up. So uh, what's going wrong here? Um, the reason is um, uh, I didn't have time to find the changelog message, but at some point in Volto, it's not that long ago, the default way uh, that the content of folders is returned by the REST API to the front end, uh, was changed to not contain all information about the objects. So how, do, how did I figure that out? That's important for you. Um, inspect uh, components, uh, look, uh, look for the, um, ins just use inspect uh, to, to find uh, the wrapper. Uh, there we have the container, uh, where was that? Summary view, here's the summary view. Okay, that's what we're using. And it has a property called content. And in the template, uh, you remember uh, I showed you this, we're iterating over uh, item for item in items, uh, uh, for item in items of content, uh, uh, for item in content items, uh, yeah, like this. So here's the summary view, here's content, and here is items. And if I expand this, and if I expand the first item here, yeah, it should, oops, I should be, yeah, it should become obvious that this is not what we saw when we look at the news item earlier, where we saw a lot of information. Here, we only see a tiny piece of uh, information that is uh, returned by the REST API, because this is the data that is available to the view method, uh, to the view component here. So there is no uh, effective, there is no image. And this is why image is not rendered. It is just there is a, a, a error in the way that the summary view is constructed. It's not getting all the data from the items in this folder. And this is why it's not possible to display a date. So why does it show a date then? And here comes the next uh, crazy thing. The moments library uh, that we're using to render the day, date uh, let me go back to the original way uh, thing. If you don't pass anything to the moments library, it returns the current date. It's uh, similar to in Py uh, like Python, uh, date time, if you call date time, it returns the current date, uh, at least zoom date time. I don't think Python date time does that. Maybe it does, I'm not sure. So this retain, uh, returns today's date, and like five years from now, this news item would still be from today, which is like super stupid. And I have no way of fixing that right now, but it's certainly something worth creating a ticket for. Um, 
And just to show you that there is um, here, when I save it, you see this actually changes. So now we have a different uh, visualization because I changed the format, but the date is still, a date is still there. So yeah, it's not our fault, it's Voto's fault. And this makes no sense to be in the summary view if the item is not passed to a summary view. So um, how do you create a ticket? So if Plone is, we haven't talked about that yet, it is a open source system and it's maintained by a huge community of volunteers. There's not a single person paid for doing any of that. We don't, Katya and me, we both don't get anything from doing, for, for giving this trend. Actually we do, but it's, it's like, it's a symbolic gesture. Uh, and uh, we don't, we actually even, we even had to uh, buy our own ticket for the conference. So um, we, we're doing this out of the sheer goodness of our hearts. And the same is true for Volto and the whole development that goes on, goes on in Plone. And uh, it's all open source, it's all available uh, there. And Volto is a repository on GitHub. It's all uh, open source. And there is a list of issues. And I could just create an issue uh, that explains what's going on here, that the images are not showing up in the, uh, in the summary view because the uh, items uh, that are passed to the uh, summary view do not contain all necessary information. There is actually, in a later chapter, there is uh, a small part uh, where we actually discuss this issue, which is actually a feature, but I wasn't aware that uh, it, it, the summary view was basically broken uh, in Volto. Okay. And you're, and you're also invited to uh, file a ticket for an issue if you find something unclear in the training documentation. That is very true. The training is, uh, okay, this is fixed base class. So there's nothing about the summary view. The training, um, since you mentioned that, I'm gonna show that the training is also open source. It's actually, um, it's not even GPL, but it is uh, Creative Commons Attribution 4, whatever that means. I'm not a lawyer, but it means you can just do whatever you want with it. Um, as long as you mention that it's open source, something like that. Um, and you can create a ticket here and say, okay, there's something wonky or you make a pull request and change stuff. And there's all the trainings that are in this, um, uh, that are on trainingplone.org are in there and Mastering Plone is one of them. And we are right now, just to show you that in Volto theming, uh, so uh, Volto theming, this is uh, the file we're looking at at the moment. And you can create a pull request, can make a change. Uh, feel free to do that. And it, yeah, that's important. So I'm um, not gonna fix that issue now. Um, okay, we already saw that we can uh, customize Plone. Uh, by overriding uh, components in um, in uh, in React uh, using component shadowing, and I quickly mentioned that we can could do something similar in Plone Classic by creating a copy of that file in a certain folder. It's basically exactly the same uh, um, approach. Um, Plone. Uh, uh, the point of this chapter is to uh, teach you that Plone is built with, on, on top of the idea to be customized and extended and not forked and branched, but that you can take almost every uh, a part and aspect of Plone and customize it in, uh, to, to uh, suit your requirements. And there are a couple of uh, extension technologies that are discussed here. I'm not gonna go into details, um, we're going to visit them uh, soon, uh, see how, the, how, how, they, uh, how they interact with Plone in different ways. Um, but basically, they allow, there's a whole system built to, to 
uh, customized plant. So why is that? Maybe that is uh, that is important. Uh, let me quickly go into the uh, into the back end of um, of Plone, the original back end in the Zope management interface. This is not only for looking at items. This is actually in Zope was built to be to as a development environment that you can write code in in the browser. So there's this select type to add, and then there is this script Python thingy where you can actually write Python code in the browser. And when you go to the URL of the ID of the object that you created, this Python code is executed in a safe way. So there is actually a, a whole huge package called, um, how's it called? Uh, restricted Python that makes sure that you're not deleting your hard drive uh, by writing a Python script, because obviously in Python, you could do that, you can delete your whole system. Um, but you don't want to do that. Uh, so this is it's 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 in, basically it's in a sandbox. It's a safe subset of Python commands that you can use in there. So Zope, when it was uh, invented, uh, was uh, the the whole idea is to give the user uh, the power to uh, customize it and extend it through the web in the browser and. The same approach is true for the file system development. There's a lot of uh, hooks and uh, crannies that you can plug into to make Plone do what you actually want it to do. So that's, and that is what we're doing. This is why in the whole training, especially in the, uh, we're not gonna write a lot of code. Most of the code that you write like uh, um, uh, lines of code wise, is copying templates from one way to, from one place to another, uh, and it's not writing; it's copying and pasting. And the things that we actually write ourselves are not that much. Um, so, and to do that, um, to to allow Plone to 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 uh, hold our own code in the back end, in this case, um, we need to uh, write a Python package. And uh, there is a, like, a lot of existing add-ons already, Python packages that are connecting to Plone that you can use to connect to Plone and extend Plone. And this chapter uh, mentions a couple, I'm not gonna uh, go through that because we're not doing uh, classic Plone. Most of them are using classic Plone. There is a later chapter about Volto add-ons that also exist. There are add-ons that change Plone backend that provide new content types, for example, that you can also use in the front end. And there are uh, add-ons that provide functionality that is used visible in the browser um, that uh, make no sense in Volto. So that you need a Volto uh, a React component to, to talk to the back end um, to that. So in some cases, you actually have a Plone add-on that comes into uh, in in two comes as two parts. And that is what we're doing in this training. We have one Plone add-on called PloneConf site, which is a Python package that we create to provide uh, extensions to Plone and overrides to Plone the backend. And we have PloneConf-Volto, uh, which is a front-end package that extends the front-end of Plone. And both are not forks or branches, they are just they override what uh, the minimum uh, that is necessary to, to make that possible. So we're gonna skip um, this whole thingy and we're gonna um, quickly, oh God, uh, I could talk for hours about that, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so this is um, to customize, uh, to configure Plone um, in the front end, you have uh, this, this package JSON that tells you it requires, I told you that before, uh, this PloneConf site package, a uh, PloneConf Volto package, uh, JavaScript package, NPM package, uh, depends on Volto, uh, so it extends that. In Python, we have something similar, and I haven't opened my editor uh, for the backend yet, so I'm gonna do that right now. 
for the very, very first time. Um, so let's add a, another terminal. Uh, training uh, from six backend code oops dot so here is my vs code instance uh, last year that was actually convenient to have two different editors for two different things because my laptop screen is pretty small so it's easy to get confused but uh, a Little confusion is it's is, is just that's just required. So this is the the backend folder that we're looking now at now, and it holds the configuration for Plone the backend um, or Plone Classic. Uh, and the most important part is the build out CFG file here. So build out is a, a configuration or orchestration system um, be, uh, that builds Plone, configures Plone, and extends Plone, and does a lot of other things. You can actually um, make, build out, compile uh, Apache or Solar for you, which is kind of stupid to do, uh, but it, it is possible. That's why I say um, it, can, it can spawn all kinds of things. Um, so here is the, um, the, the, the main file for, for build out. Um, and it, uh, here is a minimal ex minimum example for a build out that uh, is used to build a Python um, uh, plone site in Python. It has only two parts. So it's built, it's uh, separated into parts. They are, this is the any uh, syntax. You probably know that. Uh, these square brackets build out and it has one part that's this one instance and it extends so it's pluggable and extendable and it's uh, increasingly complex if you use it in real life and it has recipes so it has build out itself and it can use recipes that um, tell a part in this part in this case the part instance to to do something. And in this case, um, build plone using the recipe plone recipe zope2 instance, which is the default recipe used to build a plone uh, site. And if you use that and run build out against that using the logic that you learn when installing plone, it's just called call build out, which is the executable, uh, then it reads that and installs and builds plone from that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff in here that we're not going to go into in detail. Uh, let's quickly look at the real life example of uh, this training. So here's build out. It's like it's always the main section. It extends versions from the freshly released Z uh, six alpha plus six alpha one version. This is a URL. If I open that in the browser, it holds a Python package version pins only, lots of those. And it also extends uh, the version pins of Zoop. And the Zoop version pins, again, oh, they don't open the browser, they and, and extend and extend. So there's a whole, um, I don't know, um, a, cat, a rat tail, Rattenschwanz, uh, that, uh, that you can follow there uh, with versions. You also add, uh, extend a, uh, it also extend, pulls in the versions of a file version CFG, where we have pins for the versions that we added in our build out. And it has a couple of defaults. The most important ones uh, are this eggs, uh, Python packages, uh, like, I don't know, the, the, the um, uh, requests library or uh, plone itself or uh, pillow which is a, a python imaging library um, are called eggs um, that's uh, by the way this is why uh, the packages folder that's here used to be called omelet and in volto it's still called omelet even though the npm packages are not called eggs so that is if 
I don't know, five years from now, they don't change that. No one will ever remember that Python packages are also called eggs because nobody uses that word anymore for Python packages. Uh, and so everyone would be uh, irritated. Why are, is Volto and all the other dependencies in a folder called Omelette? Um, yeah, so that's history for you. Uh, so these eggs uh, declare what Python packages should be installed uh, for, uh, for the system we're building. And this is Plone. This Plone package pulls in everything itself. So this is a Python package. It actually lives on Pipey, but on, also on GitHub. Uh, if you go there, you can find that. It's a meta package, doesn't have any code. It just depends on, either, on, on more packages. Ah, crap, there's setup. So you need setup CFG. Here are the packages that it depends on. Where are they? Uh, install requires, setup tools, REST API, and CMF plone. And that is actually plone itself. That's the package where the code of plone exists on GitHub. So there's a shitload of code here. And that again pulls in uh, many, this time the dependencies are obviously in setup py. This pulls in a lot of additional packages. So when you install Plone, and you already did that, uh, you have a executable called uh, bin instance here, and it has all the Python packages that are used to run Plone. And these are 200 and more than 260 uh, Python packages that are used here. So, and build out is there to make it manageable to actually pin the right versions for each of these 260 packages without you going crazy. And on top of that, extend the plone that you build with your own add-ons. For example, here's some development add-ons that we're gonna discuss later and the one you, that you're writing yourself, PlonConf site. And that one will also be tested because there's a test setup that is in there. And this package, uh, PlonConf site, Hang on, is actually not downloaded from PyPy, the Python package index, but from GitHub uh, using a built out extension called Mr. Developer. There is so much to learn and to know there. So if you're not, not if you don't know that, um, you, you, you will learn it uh, through practice. It would take us a lot of time to discuss all of that. So we're gonna just jump to the end of that. This is the build out of our, there's lots of documentation here. I really, uh, I beg you to read that. There's examples for super small build outs and really big and complex build outs and uh, how to figure out how to work with that. And what are you gonna, what we're gonna do now um, or what already happened. So we're not gonna do that, but it, uh, it, if, if you would start from scratch, um, you could do that. And I'm going to just quickly show you how that works uh, because it's really cool. Um, so when you have, uh, when you follow the, the, sorry, the installation instructions, you have uh, Plone, but you don't have your own package yet. And you can create your own package using this Plone CLI command line interface uh, helper thingy. Uh, I'll go into my uh, backend folder. I'm gonna um, call that PlonConf site two. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna throw that away after I did that. I already installed Plone CLI and I create a, no, please don't uh, correct this. Otherwise it will override it. Uh, it'll ask you a couple of questions, including your GitHub username and uh, what do you wanna do that with that? And I'm gonna just answer the questions as in as uh, instructed here, but you, you don't have to do that because you already have this package. I'm just gonna uh, show you that this actually works. There is um, there's still an issue, so I get an error on iSort. I don't know why we need to iSort it automatically. I wouldn't do that, but I'm not maintaining uh, uh, that package anymore. Um, so yeah, can ignore this, uh, this uh, problem. And now when I open my editor in SRC, I just created a, from a, 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 plone, a Python package. Um, 
If you know other systems, this is uh, like cookie cutter. It's uh, cookie cutter is uh, more popular in for most uh, systems, but uh, this is real uh, used uh, using something called Mr. Bob, uh, whoever Bob is. I get probably Bob the builder or something like that. It's like names happen at clone sprints. Uh, so there is Mr. Bob and Bob templates clone creates this structure. And that is a Python package that extends clone. And why does it extend clone? Because, um, yeah, because it does. It is just, it's built uh, to extend clone. It doesn't pull in clone. You need to pull uh, that into your clone, but it is, uh, is pre-configured to be a sane approach to uh, clone extensions. I'm gonna delete the whole folder here, move it to the trash, and um, gonna get to the next item. We already did the same thing for Volto add-ons when when during installation you you did the uh, you uh, used create Volto app um, or y y didn't we switch to Yo Man or something like that? Yo. Um, to, to create the add-on. So maybe this uh, this is not the right uh, uh, name. Uh, never mind. Um, so let's have a look at the Python package that was created. Um, I used the one that I checked out, but it's exactly the same. I created it this morning around nine o'clock uh, and it's up on, it's on GitHub. So there is a, pretty complex uh, folder structure here. And, and first of all, there's a lot of files here and you will probably have no idea what they mean or what they, what, what's coverage, RC, Bob template, CFG, license. There is some license thingy here, a manifest and a setup UI. And what the heck is this? Uh, all this stuff. Um, and you could ignore a lot of that because it is mostly boilerplate. So what you see here is a build out CFG. And now we get super confused. Didn't we just, didn't, didn't the guy just say that we have our own build out for the training? It's in the folder back end. It has a file called build out CFG. Uh, where is it here? Build out CFG that pulls in the other package, uh, PlonConf site. And now I'm in PlonConf site uh, here, SRC, PlonConf site, and it has a build out CFG again. Why is that? Uh, the simple reason for that is um, you can just ignore that uh, for your, uh, for the development purposes. But the default for when you create such a new package is that it ship gives you all the defaults um, to have this a self-contained package that is testable and publish publishable on PyPy. So to be testable, it needs to have obviously clone and some test runner and all these nifty things to automatically run tests on Git, uh, using GitHub Actions, for example, or Travis CI. Um, and here, GitHub Actions, I guess that is, yeah, here, GitHub Actions. So you run tests using Plone 6 and Plone 5 and do all that stuff. So all of that is already included in this, uh, in this uh, boilerplate template and you can ignore all of that. The only thing that you need is actually inside SRC PongConf site and our oh God, again, why is that such a complex uh, folder structure? Let's go into that. Uh, LL um, SRC PlongConf.site. This is a namespace package. SRC PlongConf site. So this is, um, this is actually the, uh, yeah. Let's go into, oh, hang on. RC. When I uh, look at the tree of the whole thing that I just created, I have a pretty complex folder structure, including all these files that you don't need, and SRC, and PlonConf, and site. And this is only there to make, this again, this file self-contained, 
self-testable, self-buildable, and you can ignore all that. And every time we talk during this training about, hey, add a file in blah, 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 actually starts here and not up here. If you, when you need to add a file, you always add it in, in inside this folder structure where you have setup handlers in it, configure that ZML and so on. So this is, this is where we actually add our stuff. Um, I will repeat that uh, a couple of times. Here is in the documentation it, yeah, let's quickly go through that. The most important, uh, it's, it's all explained here. Um, the configure ZZML is a XML syntax file that registers components and stuff uh, basically for your clone site. Uh, in if you use fast API or other frameworks, you probably are used to using uh, decorators to register routes, for example. In uh, Plone, you don't do that that often. Sometimes you do, but more often you use generic uh, con uh, ZOP component markup language, ZML, to register, um, for example, uh, a view for a content type. Uh, or a interface or any code that you that you want to run. Um, we're not going to do that much, so I'll just skip ahead to the next part where we have this empty shell that looks horrible and complex. Um, but the good thing is you just run this command to create this uh, this 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 package. And then commit everything that's in there. If you look at the git, git history of the plonconf site package, uh, plonconf site, I use source tree uh, quite often for git um, for git stuff because it has a nice user interface. You see, in this initial commit that has zero features, uh, but adds a ton of files. These are all auto-generated, so just add them. And this is the important one. This is what you do yourself. This is where you uh, write your own code, this commit actually. We are at the moment here at Volta and this is like your commits. You, this is the important part. The small things where you say, hey, I have a new content type. These 500 files, um, don't think about them. Don't, don't get irritated by them at least. Okay. Um, Good, content types. I hope that was not too uh, too horrible, that part, um, but it, it's, it is what it is. It is, it's a Python is a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex ecosystem, especially if you want your stuff tested and automated. And if you have a lot of dependencies, um, if you ever try to install Sentry for, for example, by yourself, that it is horrible. It has so many dependencies. It is so many databases and containers that you need. It is just, if you have a complex system, you, you have to deal with, a, uh, with this complexity uh, that builds these things that you then can use. And we try with Plone and the build and build out and Bob templates Plone with these templates to make it as approachable as possible. And actually with Plone 6 in the future, you can just say pip install Plone and you get everything. Um, but yeah, we're not 100% there yet. Um, so installation is still a bit complex. Okay, next chapter is content types. So um, it says dexterity one content types. Why does it say dexterity? Because in Plone 4, we used to have also content types, obviously, because it's a content management system, but they were not called dexterity, but archetypes. These are basically two different frameworks. You can forget this name right away. It's, it was really important to know that dexterity exists as long as you still had archetypes around. And if you need to migrate from archetypes to dexterity, um, you, that's a complex task. Uh, but if you start with Plone 6 or Plone 5, you will only have dexterity. So actually what we're talking about is just content types. 
uh, ignore dexterity. So a content type is um, is an a instantiated object um, of a class that is defined in Python and stored in the database ZODB. Uh, that is, from the plum perspective, that is a content type. From a user perspective, a content type is something that you uh, click uh, on, a, on, a, on a add menu and select one of these content types and it is automatically created for you. So it needs to be somehow registered in Plon that a content type like here, a document, page is called document uh, in the backend, exists. Um, and also the schema of that uh, content type needs to be registered somewhere. You remember the news item had a different schema than the document. It had a lead image uh, on top of the rich text and has uh, lots of other fields. And, uh, and also when you, uh, a content type is, that's for the editor, that's a content type, but for the visitor, the content type, it's just a page that you look at. So it has three parts. One is the factory information uh, that tells Plone uh, that you can uh, actually create this thingy using a factory. Remember the factory factory? Um, and uh, the second is the schema that defines which kind of fields are then should be available. And the third thing is the visual representation. So each content type usually comes with a, some kind of visual representation to the user. It doesn't have to have one, uh, but in our case, we want one. Um, so that is uh, the important things about a content type I already uh, said uh, some things about that. So in Plon, as I said, as in so Zoop is uh, very configurable. It even goes a long way uh, to make sure you can modify existing content types and add new content types through the web. So the first thing we'll do, we'll add a new feature to a existing content type, the news item. Let's look at, um, if you go to the control panel, okay, I'll go back. So you, uh, you might have missed that. If you go to site setup, this is the control panel. It, here to the content type control panel. And there you have all these types that are available, including the news item. Click on news item. And there you see the news item and the name and all this information. We're not gonna change the name of the news item. We're gonna go to the schema of the news item. We're gonna not, gonna, not adding the FTI, but the schema, uh, not the factory type information, but the schema. And you actually get a schema editor in Volto, where you can add new fields. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a field of the type yes, no. So it's a Boolean field. You can check stuff and say, is this hot news or is this, uh, I don't know, cold news? Um, so let's do that. I'll add a new field. Uh, no, I'm not gonna add a new field set. I'm gonna add a new field here below that. And it's a yes, no field, if I can find that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I, where is my yes, no field? Uh, da, da, da. Come on. Type. Too many options here. Okay, there is a scroll bar and at the very end is the Y. Uh, yeah, maybe a, U, a small UI issue with uh, nested scroll bars. Okay, the title is uh, hot news for this field. So uh, hot news, is this hot news? Yes or no? Uh, no description, it's not required. Although if it would be required, everything would have to be hot news, which doesn't uh, kind of defeats the purpose. And uh, here's my hot news field. And now, so what do I have to do? Yeah, I have to save. And then I'll open a uh, the site in a new tab. And I go to my news listing here. 
and say the conference website online and click on edit and guess what? It's already there. Isn't that super dark magic? So I can, in, I can without writing a single line of code, without restarting the instance, um, I can add a new field to the schema to or model if uh, Django, uh, if you're a Django developer, for example, that would be a model. Um, and then you can add a hot news field and store this data and it is stored in the database. So, okay, let me uh, take you a little bit down the rabbit hole. So here is my news item. Let's go to the back end quickly. So the classic uh, thingy here, so we have news conference website online. I can edit that. I can see my button here. So I can view that. And I was always saying, okay, this is um, is the instance of a Python object. Let's make sure that it actually is PDB. If you don't know PDB, that's the Python debugger. And we have a add-on in our build out that allows us to call PDB on any object. What happens? I don't see anything. Why don't I see anything? Because I need to go to my backend, uh, which runs in the foreground. And here I have a PDB. So self context is my news item. And my news item uh, can be inspected. And my news item has a, uh, a, a new field um, that I haven't programmed, hang on, uh, that I added in the uh, editor here. And it's called hot news. So, hmm. There's a space in between. You can't have a Python uh, Python attribute with a space in between. Well, let's look at hot news self context hot news. No, minus wouldn't work as well. So maybe underscore. No, not that. Uh, minus wouldn't work again. So how can we? See that? Can we see that? No, that doesn't seem to work. Where is my hot news? Um, why can't I see that? Hang on. Am I on the right object? Conference website online? Yes. And it has hot news as a field. How is that called in this case? Let's just use the. Oh. Capital H, who came up with that idea? Uh, context here, that's, uh, yeah, here it is, uh, hot news, true. It's a under, it replaces the, uh, the space with an underscore and this is my attribute and it's actually stored persistently in the database. Um, so yes, uh, we not only uh, magically created uh, a field, it is actually stored in the same way in the database. I'm not a huge fan uh, that in uh, Volto new fields have uh, uppercase characters. Uh, that seems stupid because in the back end, these are all lowercase automatically. Um, but yeah, that's... Uh, tiny, tiny issues. Okay, we did that. Uh, we can edit that, we save it. We can, yeah, look at um, plenty of stuff here. Uh, we can even create com com complete uh, new content types through the web, uh, not only modify existing ones, we can just say add talk and have a talk content type there. And do I need to restart my site? Do I need to do anything? No, it's already there. So it is, it's beyond imaginable uh, what dexterity or the, the content types uh, in Plone uh, allow you to do. You can create custom types through the web, uh, but we're not gonna do that. I'm gonna delete this thing because we are not mouse pushers. We are developers. We want to do stuff and have people 
uh, check the Git history uh, in two years from now and say, hey, what did you do there? That was horrible. Why did you do that? Um, so we're going to write a content type in uh, Python and register that in a Python package as a dependency of clone. So why do we do that? Not only because we want to show off what we know, but because our projects tend to be have a long lifespan. Uh, we're doing sites for universities. Uh, I don't know, clone runs the Brazilian government website and a lot of UN sites and stuff like that. So it's it's not your uh, your your neighbor bakery. It, these these projects have a lifespan not of years but sometimes of decades. And if you if you and and they have tens of thousands to millions of content and a lot of custom code. So they they need to fulfill uh, certain requirements for stability and. If you just create your content type through the web and click around a little uh, until you achieve your goal, um, if you leave this project and five years from now a new developer comes in, he will be completely lost and he will hate you, which may not interest you, but his life is then miserable and it should be uh, in your interest to make uh, the life of other developers uh, great. So we're going to do that in Python. Um, and not through the web. Oh God, should we? Oh, it's already half past six. Um, Katya, what do you think? Uh, we're way behind schedule, are we? Uh, should we make a short break before we do another uh, half hour to cre actually create these talks? Last year we were quicker, I have the, uh, I have the feeling. What do you think? Um, you want to make a break? We have only half an hour now. From now on, um, uh, I think people are. You did uh, do they, a break, uh, yes, but maybe maybe just a short bathroom break, five minutes. Maybe I don't know what time is for you. You can get a beer depending on your time zone. And, and uh, yeah, five minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Uh, let's have a five minute break. Uh, let's actually really meet in five minutes uh, so we can take, uh, get the most out of the next uh, 30 minutes. And if, again, if you have questions, please put them in the Slack. Uh, we'll try to discuss them. Um, am I too, oh, someone said I was not loud enough. Sorry, um, didn't see that. Um, see you in five. I Paul, um, yeah, maybe you need to restart your browser or reload the page. The developer tools, when they're freshly installed, um, may need a little kicking. So here's components, and then you can inspect. Uh, I, there's two inspect buttons. This is for HTML, and this is for React components. I, I always click the wrong one, so. And this should then show up. And you need, for some reason, this uh, scrolls very far to the right. Uh, and then you can find that. Yeah. OK, let's continue um, with the talks. We are way behind schedule, but um, yeah, that's it's just what it is. Um, I don't know where we lost so much time, but it is, um, yeah. Okay, um, we will register a custom type. So why do we why do we do that? Oh, excellent, Paul. Good. Um, so since we're organizing a conference uh, and we could have talks as documents and say, okay, it's topic, uh, speaker, whatever uh, information is just in in HTML. But if you want to sort your content by speaker or link to that specifically or order that by date uh, or day or room or stuff like that, it is good to have structured content. Um, data is, is, is just, it's 
perfect as structured content. Talks is perfect for that. So first, uh, I said we, we need three parts for a content type. First is the type uh, factory information. So we tell Plone that there is a content type called talk um, that is uh, should be available in Plone. So to do that, we go into PloneConf site, and that means SRC, PloneConf.site, SRC, PloneConf site, and then in profiles. So from now on, we say go into profiles or PloneConf site profiles. This is where you end up because the Python namespace actually ends up here also. In uh, use the default profile, uh, not the uninstalled profiles. The default profile is where configuration ends up that uh, you put configuration in there that is applied upon installation of your add-on. And here you create a new file called types.xml and you paste the content from this snippet here. So oh God, why is this not Python? Can't we do this in Python? This is XML. Uh, this is something called generic setup. It's one of the extension uh, approaches for Plone. And everything you have something in XML and you make a change in XML, this is only applied upon installation of uh, an add-on. So after I saved that and I reinstall or install my add-on, this code is then read. Restarting, reloading the browser won't help you. You need to install this package because then the generic setup profile is applied. And this generic setup profile will raise an error because it says there should be a type called talk in uh, my profile and it's not. There's only document for some reason, uh, for a very good reason, but we need a talk XML as well. And that lowercase for custom content types, I always use lowercase, you can do what you want, but uh, I think lowercase is a good best practice. You copy and paste the whole FTI here. So um, I haven't learned anything right now. That's what you probably say. Uh, that's not true. Uh, you've learned something very, very important because uh, you can copy and paste code. And you can copy and paste code from a, the location uh, where it is always updated, like not every month, but it uses these same defaults. And it is what I do uh, at least twice or three times a week when I write my custom uh, client projects. I go to the mastering clone training documentation, go to the chapter that is close to what I'm doing and copy the defaults that are in there and make the changes to um, that are required for my client project. Because I'm just way too lazy to type all this stuff. This is, and I, I don't want to memorize that and nobody wants to. These are, there are a lot, there's a lot of documentation about the mastering clone training is certainly uh, the most up-to-date and the most uh, comprehensive one um, if you want to uh, deal with uh, creating con and modifying content types. So, um, and this is, it's basically the same approach as like Plone does it. You don't fork Plone. Uh, you also don't fork the mastering Plone training. You just take the bits and pieces that you want for your projects and you use them and then you uh, change what, what is required uh, in your projects. And this time we don't have to change anything, obviously, because we uh, specify a content type called talk, which has a title with an uppercase T. It has an icon, it has a factory, an ad view, and it has a class, a Python class that is used to instantiate the object that then lives in the database. And it has a schema that is both not yet in existence. And it has a couple of behaviors. We'll get to these later. <coughs> so this is your FTI. And um, it's basically uh, the first part is done. You registered 
uh, a content type for Plone. The second part is the schema. You need a schema. And the schema can be done in multiple ways. Again, we could use the browser to click uh, to add fields until we have our schema. And that is absolutely OK to do that if your project has a limited lifespan or if you do rapid prototyping. But if you have a longer running project, it would be better to do that in the file system. And again, there's two ways to do that. One is again in XML, but I hate XML. It, XML is written for robots. I'm not a robot, I'm a human being. I wanna read Python, I wanna write Python because Python is meant for humans. So uh, we're gonna create a, uh, a Python module inside our package. A module is a folder with a init py file, if you don't know that. So here, content, that folder obviously already exists. Uh, for me, for you, it should not init py. Uh, so now we have, there is a module called content. It doesn't contain anything yet. And in there, we create a file called talk.py. Uh, that then is uh, a, I have that here, talk.py. And that will hold the schema. I'll just copy and paste the whole thing and save it. And then uh, I'll go through that um, step by step. Um, so here we define uh, the schema. It, it is basically a Python representation of what we saw, uh, uh, not here, but here. This is, uh, this is the, um, the user facing representation of the same thing that we're looking at now for a different type, obviously. So we define a schema, which is a interface. It's a, it's a it inherit a interface. Okay, I'm not gonna go into uh, th interface theory, uh, but it, it defines a contract, basically the contract. Um, that talks um, have these uh, attributes and can do these and the such and such a thing. Um, so this is the interface and it's defined, uh, it is referenced here in the class. Uh, so this uh, here, this is the interface. It's uh, with the schema, a uh, schema, and then there's class again with a K because C is uh, would be reserved reserved word at some point when you load that and you get error messages. So that's why it has a K. Uh, and then there, uh, hang on, here at the very bottom is a talk. This is the instance. So when a, you create a talk then or a news item, this is the object or the news item in, that, in the other uh, case will be instantiated and it implements this interface so that it can store these the values that are uh, added to the fields in the uh, the the, um, the widgets in the browser and can store these these values as attributes persistently in the database. So okay, so this always again you don't have to memorize all of that when you write your own content type. You go to the mastering clone training, and you copy and paste this thing here, the whole thing, if you want. And you throw away what you don't need, and you add what you need. I'll show you how you how to find what else you need in the next chapter. So here we have a couple of fields, type of talk, and they uh, <coughs> follow a. Um, they have a certain each field has a certain type. You remember we added the hot news field, which was a yes no field, or boolean would be like this. Uh, in this case, it's a choice field which stores strings, uh, so text. Here, uh, one of these values. Here we have a rich text field. It's in, it's imported from a different place. The definition of rich text field. But it, again, this is something you don't have to memorize. You can copy and paste that from dexterity documentation. That is actually the next chapter. Is the uh, dexterity documentation itself. And each field has a title. And what is the title? It's not super uh, um, 
un, uh, not super unexpected. This is the title of the field here. The title of the field is summary. Here, the title of the field is hot news. A description of a field is, for example, this here. This is some help text. Uh, this is the um, description. Uh, you can configure various fields uh, as required. So there has to be something in there. Either a box needs to be checked or you need to add some text and so on. Here's a text line field. That's a very simple one. Uh, speaker where you can just add a line of text has a title description is not required and so on and so forth. And there's an interesting one. There's blob image. Uh, named blob image, which makes sure that the file is actually stored not in the database, but only a pointer to that file is stored in the database. And the file itself ends up in the file system where binary data is best stored. So after I save uh, this file, um, I need to, um, what, what do you think would I need to do? So this is, um, we extended uh, Plone in two ways. We added a, a factory type information for talk here. Um, we referenced that factory type information in the portal types tool. That's how it's called uh, that we extend here with a new content type. And then we added a Python module. Python modules are only read on startup. So we can't, reloading the browser wouldn't help us. So at least we need to restart our instance. Just stop it with uh, control C and restart it with bin instance FG. Remember that you need to do that for the back end, not the front end in this case. And then um, we, uh, as I said, the XML files are only read upon installation of the add-on. So, here we have a problem because the add-on PlonConf site that we created here is already installed. Remember when we created the site, we checked the box at the very bottom of the list of add-ons that are available. So it's already installed. How do we reinstall that? Um, actually, the way to reinstall that is to uninstall it and install it again. And um, at this point, it is actually still safe to do so. It will at some point no longer be safe, but uh, we'll see that. So where are my add-ons? Here are add-ons. So in the list of installed add-ons here, five installed add-ons, there's PlonCon site. And I can say, oh, just drop that, remove it. And PlonCon site, just reinstall it install it again. So I clicked my button here and a couple of things happened in the back end. So you see it was applying the profile PlonConf site default. Remember the folder called default uh, held this. Then it installed roles permissions. Why is that? Did we do anything there? No, we didn't do anything there but there is a empty role map XML that can hold custom roles and permissions. And that file was read and applied. So nothing changed, but it said, hey, there's a file, I'm gonna read that. Um, catalog was imported because there is a catalog XML, again, empty, but there is more types tool imported, document type import and more, and talk in type info imported. So it obviously saw that we had this and it saw that we had these files, these two files, and then it was, um, it, it, it applied these profiles. So this configuration is now somehow in the database. And it's, yes, it is visible in the front end when we, uh, let me move this thing, uh, when we move uh, to the, to the, uh, dexterity control panel, we can see our new type here, talk, here it is, uh, similar to when we would have added that. And we can actually uh, see, oops, uh, the schema that we defined. So this is the schema, it's all there. 
And it's not only visible in Volto as a admin where you can modify that, but again, um, in the back end, in Plone has Plone has a uh, the Plone Classic has a equivalent of that user interface. Not going to show you that, but the types tool that uh, stores that configuration actually has a user interface in the ZOAP management interface, portal types. And here is my talk content type. And here is my reference to the schema and the behaviors and the class and whatnot. So a lot of stuff is in multiple places. And that is because Plone wasn't built last year. It has quite some history. Uh, and this is where you see that various layers on top of each other. Um, okay, to make, um, to finish that, let's go to schedule and add a talk. Here it is. Dexterity for the win. Some Latin nonsense, please. A type of talk here we have, I said it's a choice field with uh, strings, uh, text uh, to pick from. Here you have a rich text field. You can add some rich text, uh, add that and yeah, edit that. Add stuff. Audience, again, a choice field. In this case, a multiple choice field. Beginner, advanced professional, dexterity is for everyone. A field for the speaker, that is, or uh, let's go back into history. Uh, Martin S. Bailey, uh, one of the brains that dreamed up dexterity. Uh, I have no idea where he works at the moment. Um, let's pretend he works for me. That would be fun. Uh, Martin at clone.org shouldn't probably shouldn't have a space let's see yay so um this email field obviously isn't a text field because otherwise it wouldn't have complained that it's not a valid email address so having the schemata is not only uh cool to show off that you uh know how to do that but with certain fields you get validate data validation input validation and that is obviously super important uh, so you have valid data in your database and that you don't end up with invalid data so if i don't know clone if you later try to send an email to all these people who registered uh, as speakers uh, you don't get error messages philip um, there's a question yes Let's see, Paul, it is stored in the DB, but you should have the schema. Gonzalo. Uh, going, oh, the first one. If you create the schema through the web, it gets stored in the data database. Yes, is that why you say it's not good for long projects? Yes, the, ski, the, the, uh, the schema is, if you create it through the web, uh, it is stored as XML in the database and um, you, there is a way to export that. You can export a uh, schema uh, into X as XML and uh, import that into your Python package to put it into uh, version, con version control. Um, so that is a totally valid uh, approach. And the earlier versions of this trainings actually did this. So we created the content type talk through the web exported the XML into your Git repository and uh, committed that to, to Git. Um, but as I, it's a matter of choice. Um, I much prefer Python to XML. Um, it is feature equivalent a schema, uh, but there are tiny things uh, that you, Sometimes you need to use in in, in comp more complex projects that you can't do in uh, in XML. For example, um, default uh, context-aware defaults. So a, a method that runs 
to define a default value for some field that takes into account where this, um, this object is uh, created and so on. So a couple of more examples like that. So these uh, in Python, you can yeah, basically do everything. Uh, so that's why I much prefer that. And Paul had another question. It is, to, oh, he answered that question. That is actually nice. Uh, okay, let's uh, add some website here. Uh, I think blah, something like that. Okay, I'm not Martin. I should not pretend to be Martin. He's so much smarter than me. So let's pretend I will do that. Talk. I uh, can upload an image, a biography. You, 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 you see, uh, obviously. And um, the third part uh, that is uh, that I meant said a content type is made out a a view representation. You get that automatically. Um, but, and that's a big but, um, this is, we don't see any of the, uh, of the exciting data that we just added. Only uh, Plone Classic so far has uh, that feature. So when we go to schedule and see the dexterity for the wind torque, I can see a default rendering of the values in that schema, which is, often good enough, especially for, I don't know, internal use as internet, stuff like that. But uh, as a, um, for visual representation to a client uh, or, or a conference website, uh, th this is not like, this is like Excel. It just dump me an Excel sheet. You, what, what do you think you're doing? That's not okay. Uh, so n don't do that. Uh, we, in the next chapter, we're gonna uh, Im much improve that. So we already um, created this type. Uh, we tested this type. You see the, the user interface is slightly, uh, is slightly different, but if we change this to a keynote, for example, and um, save it, and we edit that again in Volto, we have the same data. So here's the keynote now. So this is, again, this is the React front end talks to the same back end. Uh, as Katya already said, um, at some point you need to decide uh, which user interface you need to take and you can't really switch back and forth in, in like one folder in Volto and the other in Classic, but the data is in both places. We're gonna uh, take care of the visual representation of uh, the data in, in React uh, only. So uh, what else is there to say? Um, yeah, I'm gonna ignore that. We created our first content type, custom one in Python. So it's readable, it's great to, to, um, to, uh, to test and to repeat the process and change it for the next iteration. Uh, you can control all kinds of data that is stored in the database for these talks. You could extend the schema now in the later stage, we can do that. And if I said this is what you learned was not how to actually write a schema, but you learned how to copy and paste the best parts for, a, uh, for writing a schema. And the next chapter, um, we have five more minutes to discuss that is the dexterity reference documentation about all schemas that are uh, fields that are available in uh, for you when you create your content types. And this is where you need to go when you have a requirement and you need to fulfill that. And this is, oh, this is how, you, how do I do that? How do I do this? This is, these are all types of fields that are available and they are all, which is kind of crazy. They're all in one content type. So there is one content type called example in this schema and it has uh, various field sets for various um, uh, field types. So these are field sets here, different field sets. And uh, you can, uh, so they're, they're sorted by, here you see these sort dates, date fields have one field set, uh, text fields have one field set and stuff like that. 
And here are, I'm not gonna go through them, uh, don't worry. Uh, here are uh, examples for all kinds of fields that you will probably ever need. And there are plenty of those. And to make things even better, there is a uh, screenshot for how these field sets, also, also these fields, look like in Plone Classic, um, all of them, and also how they look like in Volto in modern Plone um, 6. So you can check them. They Some look a bit different, handle a bit different. Uh, that's all discussed here. And on uh, to make things even better, there is a Python package that has this content type and it's installable and it is, where the heck is it? I had, I should have added a link to that uh, example. Uh, come on. Uh, example.con, I have obviously forgot to add the link. It's called example.content type. It comes in two branches. One is called Volto and one is called master uh, because some fields don't work in Volto. Um, they are fields that you don't usually use. For example, time uh, de delta, which stores the difference of time, which is why would you need a field for that? Um, yeah, so, um, and so this is where you can, uh, you can install that, uh, you can, check that and look at the, here's the schema for Plunk Classic and here's the schema for Volto, which has a couple of fields are uh, commented out because they don't work. For example, the data grid field, you can use that, uh, install that and play around with these packages or you just copy and paste the schema from here. Um, there is more, uh, there are third party packages in here the data grid field, which is in Plone Classic, an excellent addition to Plone to, uh, to add uh, an arbitrary number of lines of, again, schema defined data. So you have, uh, for example, uh, the field would be um, talks, but the talks are not content types itself, but a simplified schema with title, speaker, and type of talk. And you have a, an infinite, can add an infinite number of rows of that data to that. And something very similar is the mixed field that uh, Katya, uh, I think, created, where you have uh, something, again, a, a data grid uh, where you can add rows of data that are defined in a schema. Uh, and the code for all of this is here. You can have that you need the object list widget to display, uh, to, to be able to input that data. And then you have these kinds of items. You will actually see these uh, at a later stage um, um, in, in, in some of the blocks uh, in, in Plone, for example, um, no, I'm not gonna jump ahead there. There's a search block or a, actually the collection. The collection has, you can have defined criteria and each criterion, you can have infinite number of criteria is similar to a data grid field or these kinds of blocks. Um, and that's the code for that. Here's some links to widgets and there is also information in this chapter. So this is, this is why you really need to keep this bookmarked because it has all the information what you can do on top of that with the schema, because you, I, I, uh, I went over that. Here's a directive to change the widget of the choice field to a radio field widget uh, to make that radio buttons and not a drop-down list. So you might wonder, uh, yeah, why did I see a drop-down list then? Because this, radio field widget doesn't work in Volto yet. There is only a radio field widget for Plone Classic. So when you edit a content type, uh, this content type in Plone Classic, you get a different widget. This one 
instead of a drop down widget because I think it is stupid to have a drop down if you only have three options. If it's 50 options, obviously you want drop down and not uh, radio buttons because you'll have a full page of radio buttons, which is horrible. Um, so you can uh, you can define uh, the widgets here. And there is more, you can, uh, there's uh, validation, you can constrain the data. Um, you can have uh, with methods that and then called upon ent entering the data automatically, they're called and they re can raise a uh, exception if uh, the date, for example, of a event is uh, after the start date of the event or like you can't start after you already stopped obviously uh, then factory uh, default factory or default values um, what else is there there's an invariant to validate data a uh, context aware uh, that's it that's a lot of, you can do basically everything with this with these uh, couple of snippets so we've reached uh, the end of uh, today's training and next up tomorrow morning, no, not tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, at least for uh, us Europeans, um, we will realize that our schedule is, uh, the talk is nice, but it looks terrible. We know we want to display the data. So Katya will walk you through creating a view for this talk in uh, Plone uh, in Volto in uh, with the, the new uh, front end. And um, if you're um, so inclined, you can you could also look at view the old version of that, where we discuss creating a view for the same uh, content type in Plone uh, Classic, which obviously uh, works completely different. You write page templates in Chameleon, while here you write your page templates, which are not page templates, as view components in React. So that's an exciting chapter uh, for tomorrow. If you want, we can, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can discuss them now. I don't need, we don't need to go right away. Obviously, there, at some point there is dinner in Sorrento, I think at eight uh, for Katya, but if you have questions, uh, or feedback, ask it now uh, or in the chat and we will answer that uh, tomorrow morning before Katya starts up, uh, starts off with this uh, chapter 23. Yeah, I think we should start uh, tomorrow with uh, 10 minutes questions and answers. But if you have no uh, question that it would be good, then we will be better prepared tomorrow. Um, yeah. I guess we drown you in content. Don't be shy. If you have questions, uh, you can also ask us uh, by email or in the Slack. Uh, we'll see that tomorrow morning. Slack will be open all day, all night, obviously. Stop sharing my screen. It may be, maybe uh, for those who are still there, uh, a sneak preview uh, as a motivator for what's coming uh, tomorrow. We're probably not gonna get as far as we did last year, uh, but um, after we created this, the, the visual representation for talks where we will, you will probably learn, unless you already know all of that, uh, a lot about React components and what nice tools you can use there to make beautiful, uh, yeah, pages, renders. Uh, we will learn about behaviors to um, extend the content type. So. The content type is there to extend Plone uh, with a new content type, obviously, and behavior can be there to extend that content type. So it's it's like it's like Lego. You put these little uh, Legos, uh, or even, it's even better than Lego. I can't, I don't have a reference right now, but it, it, we can extend this piece 
with some, something that already exists to give it more features and more functionality with the right, without writing a single line of code, which is extremely powerful. So the best code that is created in this training is the one that is not written, but is reused by just plugging the right components on top uh, or together, just connecting the right uh, dots. And that's what we're going to do uh, in the chapter 24, also 25. We're not going to write a lot of code there. And uh, more complex code will be the, the listing view for talks. That's more React for you. And uh, we'll discuss. Uh, I love chapter 30, where we do a small change to give a lot of power to uh, existing content types again. And um, if we can get there, we'll add a customizable functionality, um, a, a control panel where you can configure the site. Because here in, in Plone, you can go here to the control panel and you configure all kinds of things. And obviously, you can do that with your own add-ons to say, um, I don't know uh, what types should be listed in what kind of uh, listing block and stuff like that. You can do whatever you like uh, to, 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 to extend Plone. So that's super powerful. Um, that's the whole idea of this training to teach you about these little uh, components that you can hook into to reuse them because Plone is already so big uh, you probably, there, most of the requirements you get from your projects or your clients, you won't have to write a single line of code for them because they either exist as an add-on or as a feature that you don't know, or as a combination of these two, you just combine this add-on with this feature and voila, there you are. Uh, and that is, uh, that, yeah, that's the magic. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, Katya, I wish you, uh, what, what's for dinner in Sorrento? Oh, <laughs> don't know, sorry. The restaurant in Sorrento is excellent. So if you ever get a chance to go to Plone Open Garden, which uh, usually happens in spring and is now not Plone Open Garden, but the Plone Conference fan zone, uh, the restaurant on top of the uh, restaurant with a beautiful view of Mount Vesuvius has gorgeous food it's just terrible you come back a couple of pounds heavier than you went there probably i always do okay any last words for day today thanks for bearing with us uh, thanks for listening i hope we didn't uh bore you to death or uh overloaded you with information the good thing is you can always re-watch the video on youtube make it slower or faster or skip chapters. And uh, the second good thing is you can read all of that or most of that at least in the online training. Um, thanks for tuning in and have a great evening and talk to you tomorrow. And um, guten Appetit, Katja. Thanks for attending and yeah, hope to see you tomorrow.